Good afternoon and welcome to today's city council meeting. Our meetings are public and you are welcome to join us in person or by watching from the council's agenda page on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, or SLC TV. We hope you'll continue to join us in whichever manner you feel most comfortable. Today is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment. Sorry, one our moment. They can't hear us on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> so you are not welcome to join on Zoom yet. Because yeah. Texted him, I don't know. This is a, the most updated unresolved issues, yeah. The timestamp at the top, just in case that helps you keep track of which versions we're dealing with. <laughs> Testing. Can anyone on Zoom hear? Testing. Can anyone on Zoom hear us? I think they can Have hold music or something playing in here. <laughs> okay, it looks like they can hear us now. All right. Well, I will proceed. Um, today is a work session meeting during which there is no public comment, but our next opportunity for public comment will be on June 6 during our 7 p.m. formal meeting. You are, the public is also always uh, welcome to send feedback anytime by mail at P.O. Box 145476, Salt Lake City, Utah 84114, or by email at council.comments at slcgov.com, or you can call our 24-hour phone comment line 801-535-7654. Uh, any written comments received by the council office on agenda related topics are shared with all council, me council members and posted to the website slccouncil.com. And so now we will begin our work session. The first item on the work session is item one, the fiscal year 2023-24 budget for the Salt Lake City Fire Department. We have Jennifer for Bruno, uh, Deputy Director of the Council Office. I see Chief Lieb and who else do you have with you, Chief Lieb? Council Chair, I have my two assistant chiefs, Chief Mill and Chief Fox, and then my community health access team manager, Natasha Thomas. Great. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just give a brief uh, uh, introduction and then I'll turn it over to the department. The proposed budget for fiscal year 24 can be found, for, fi for the fire department, can be found on pages 196 to 200 of the budget book. 
the proposed budget increases the fire department by about 7.6%, which is about 3.7 million. Most of the increase is due to staffing. Um, however, of that staffing, five are proposed to be at the airport, which is fully reimbursable by the airport fund. Um, the proposed budget is adding a medical response team at the airport. Within the general fund, the expansion is for the community health access team, the chat team. Uh, that's four employees proposed to be added to that, as well as one fire captain to assist with the medical response team, of which there are now several across the city. With that, I'll turn it over to the chief. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate that. Uh, we can go to the next slide. And another, please. So, Council, I'll just give you a general overview of our budget uh, with this slide. Our ongoing expenses are 651225 Our one-time expenses, 179500 And that makes our total fiscal year 2024 budget request of 830725 um, As Jennifer stated, our new fiscal year 2024 FTEs proposed is five. In addition, we have five uh, additional FTEs for the airport, which are budget neutral. Uh, we have five insights in our budget proposal for fiscal year 2024. Next slide, please. Our first insight is, is directly related to the community health access team. So I wanted to give the council a little bit of background on what we've seen over the first six months of operations. Uh, we are currently into our ninth month, June 1st, of our pilot program. And as a reminder, we have three social workers in the fire department right now. Two in the field, and we have one social work manager, Natasha, who sits behind me. Um, what you see here are the metrics that we are using as a fundamental baseline for the operation. So we've had 270 total responses for the community health access team, or CHAT. We've had 357 uh, crew referrals, which means the team did not actually respond to the scene. They were either unavailable uh, or couldn't get there. Um, but the crews have given, provided the chat team these names of people that may benefit from chat intervention. We have 135 cases where we have avoided emergency department transport. So that's avoiding, uh, that's getting these patients the, the appropriate uh, care and service that they need rather than sending them to the emergency room, which is an ideal for any non-life-threatening situation. And sometimes we end up seeing that same patient within the next 24 hours. Uh, we have a 143 uh, instances where we canceled the police department, where police intervention simply was not necessary, but oftentimes they are on scene, so we've been able to cancel them uh, that many times. And lastly, we have 91 instances where we did not need a fire department truck or an engine. That's what we call a heavy, heavy apparatus. And we can put a, we can actually put a cost to how often or, or what that amounts to, 91 calls where a heavy apparatus is not needed. And that is upwards of $90,000 just in this case, because our hourly rate for four firefighters on one apparatus uh, is almost $1,000 an hour. Lastly, one of our metrics you'll see in the, in the box to the right of the slide, um, indicates how often chat was unavailable to respond. And this is what we're finding to be our biggest challenge right now after the first eight months, that we simply have too many responses, too many calls, too many referrals, too many opportunities to provide this service, and not enough personnel. So if you look at the box, it, it frankly just says that we've been unable to respond to 239, which is approximately 72% of 334 calls involving, involving a psychiatric patient or substance abuse issue. And I think that speaks volumes to where we currently are. Uh, this, this program is being utilized. It's being, um, it's being used by the firefighters. It's being accepted uh, throughout the city on this department. And we just need more personnel to make it go because we have a need and this is certainly filling that niche. Next slide, please. This leads us to our first insight, community health access team additions. We gave it a city matrix score of 30 and a Moscow score of must. Uh, the request total is 398,667. This amounts to four social workers uh, funding for 10 months. We assume it's gonna take us at least eight weeks to locate social workers and hire them. That's the 10 months. Next slide, please. 
Insight number two, ongoing expense items. Uh, we scored this a 28 on the budget matrix and on the Moscow it's also a must. Uh, this is simply additional budget to address contractual and inflationary increases. These are things such as utilities, uh, contracts with technology, um, cell phones, things like that. Just really the cost of doing business and this amounts to $186,606. Next insight please. Our third insight is our fifth FTE coming directly from the fire department budget. It is one fire captain uh, funding for six months. This individual will be directly responsible for the medical response teams that we're seeing throughout Salt Lake City now. That's uh, two firefighters on an SUV. They respond to the more lower acuity calls of which we have a lot. Um, so at this point, we need someone to manage those MRTs throughout the city. We have three of them now. We have one at station, uh, station five, we have one at station six on the west side of the city, and we have one in Sugar House at station three. And ideally, I see a fourth one in the northwest quadrant of the city soon enough. This request total is 131,452. Next slide, please. Our fourth insight is life safety items. We scored this a 22 on the city budget matrix and a Moscow score of must. This is SCBA self-contained breathing apparatus, hydrostatic testing. These bottles need to be tested every five years. We have a new batch of bottles that are coming up on their five-year mark right now. Uh, so we need uh, the funds to make sure that they are operating properly. We also included in this an SCBA compressor replacement. Uh, that ultimately fills the bottles so the bottles are prepared for the firefighters to don and move into an atmosphere that's certainly uh, hazardous. So this request is 114,000. Next slide, please. Our last insight, as I referred to earlier, is revenue cost neutral items for five ARF full-time employees. ARF aircraft rescue firefighters, this is for the airport. This is cost neutral at an amount of 764,666. Next slide. Thank you, this is a summary of our fire department insights, all five that I just discussed and uh, that wraps up our budget presentation of Mayor Mendenhall's recommended fiscal year 24 budget for the fire department. Next slide is just questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Lead. So the 800 and, can we go back to that last slide? 837.25, that is the total of all the new items, both one time and ongoing. Yes, that's okay. a total budget request, council member. Thank you. Council members, do you have questions? For Jennifer, Chief Lead. Yeah, yeah thank you. you again, Mr. Chair. Uh, Chief, you, we're asking for four chat team members and, and the chief uh, to get to that fully uh, back to 72% that are not being the, uh, BC or being able to handle because of staffing. Would you need an additional four after that, or would it be, is there some type of balance there between when they're being un, uh, uh, you can't handle the calls weekends or different shifts at night because yeah, you're only working at days right yeah it's a fair fair question council member uh, this would be a good number for us it would bring our total to seven chat personnel specifically it would allow us to put two two um, social workers on the east side of the city at station five where they are right now by the whale that's station five in case someone, and then we would also be able to put two social workers Monday through Saturday on the west side at station six, which is by the Smiths on Indiana Avenue and Ninth West. Also, we'd have two in the public safety building that are handling the referrals that we're getting, because we're getting a lot of referrals from the crews because chat's unavailable to get to their scene. Um, so this would put us, we think it's a good number, I cannot say, council member, that it would be the end all, or this would be it, because the program is, in, in eight months, this program has developed to a point much more functional than we even anticipated. And the firefighters are utilizing it, and they want these resources to be available. And when I'm, for instance, I'm in my car on the radio listening to calls, I hear a lot of crews on scene saying, is chat available, is chat available? They're asking dispatch. And more often than not, dispatch says, we don't have a chat available right now. So I think this will really help us out on a daily basis. The MRTs are working Monday through Saturday. I would like to see a social worker with the two of those MRTs that whole period during the day. 
appreciate that because I, I mean, I, this is a great program. And just your numbers from the, the, the six months there, the emergency rooms, uh, EDs, right? Yeah. That's that's a thousand dollars a call. I, I always I use that estimate. You know, any time we call an ambulance, it's a grand. And so that's you're saving the city and you're saving everyone across the board a lot of uh, stress relief and a lot of uh, and financial dollars. So I appreciate and I appreciate those metrics because those are very helpful because you can equate that with a dollar and, and you can equate that with uh, additional services that, that that police officer can take. So I appreciate those metrics that you have there. And uh, well, and that's a thousand dollars that the individual doesn't pay. Right? Yeah, but it's but, not like but, we don't send them a bill. They no, no, but, yeah. they're diverted from yeah yeah diverted from ch charging someone. Not just I mean I, I think I'm trying to amplify what you're saying. It's not just the city saved a thousand. It's the individual person that was in a crisis saved a, however many thousand dollars if they didn't have to go to the yeah. emergency room. Yeah. So, but ideally, they receive appropriate care. Right. 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 Because right. our social workers have that toolbox, which yeah. the firefighters don't. <laughs> Uh, they don't know all the service providers we have throughout the city, and they're not in a position to make sure that that patient gets to there. And the other calls that you said that you, uh, you were able to cancel the police officer's response, which is also a great avenue. Now, now you have people uh, focused on the problem that they can that they are skilled to, to handle. The police officer is skilled at one job. Chat team is skilled at another position job, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Th this number will enable us to provide effective service during the day, council member. And you said something about overnight. It will not enable us to have a social worker on overnight. Um, what we have seen is that the vast majority of our calls are doing the, during the daytime hours when the city is occupied. There are some calls that come in overnight where chat is unavailable because there's no, ne there isn't no staffing for that right now. And on Sundays, there's no one available on Sundays. Um, but it should get us to a point where we should have someone available in a, in a regular business day that can come out and respond. Have, Wonderful. Thank you. I have a question, Chief. Chief. You're, you're saying you mentioned that the, two, the four additional chat team members would be co-located with the MRT teams. Is that, is that the ideal model going forward? Is it the MRT and the chat team is sort of a, an individual team? That, or, and do we just need to call it one thing or <laughs> yeah it's still we we still consider it until we've done this for a year council member it's a pilot program so mm -hmm. we're doing we're doing two different types we are co-locating a social worker with the mrt and calling it chat when there's a social worker on the team it becomes a chat response if there's no social worker available it's just an mrt so there's no social workers that go without an mrt no they will not respond right, right okay. now the other part of the model comes out of the public safety billing and a social worker will respond with one firefighter from the building and that from our medical division at least one i see and they'll go out and they'll handle referrals they are not currently being dispatched directly to the scene they're being asked to respond by the crews or they've heard something on the radio where they think they can make a difference and they self-respond so we're looking at those two models i will tell you from my perspective initially i think uh, having the social worker on the mrt is working well we didn't know how long that would delay other MRT calls. You know, how, if, if there is a social work intervention, how long will that MRT be there? There's no, there, maybe there's no physical trauma going on, but there is psychological or substance abuse trauma, and the social worker is working with the patient. The MRT has to be there with them because they're, they're together all the time. Mm -hmm. So we were interested in how long the MRT would be out of service. We do not think that at this point it's really a significant delay in service for other MRT calls. So that's looking positive. Okay. Councilmember Petro. Um, I just want to take a moment and be positive because I'm always like bash like beating this drum. Your metrics are beautiful. Like like I know where the cost savings are. I know where the mandate for expansion is. I know the mission of what is happening. Thank you for this clarity. It is amazing, and it should be a model for everyone. When, especially, we are piloting a new program. I know that this one is worth additional inv investment. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Petro. Appreciate that. Councilmember Alden Ross. Thank you. This is so exciting! Yay! I'm so excited about this. I knew it. I we all knew it, but I knew it. We talked about this metrics and how it's going to show that it works. We go and advertise uh, at the federal level all the time with our, you know, um, with our uh, peers up there. Um, so I'm excited to send this to them as well, to so that they know how Salt Lake City, the capital cities, you know, is doing the alternative response models. 
for the social things that are happening in every city, but you know how we take care of business here and how we're going to keep taking care of business and that we need their support as well, not just Salt Lake City, the county, the state, and our, um, our group up there, our um, representatives and senators. But having that said, I'm excited to expand this. So I'm support of this, obviously. I, was one, I have two questions. This new, this four new FTEs, are they going to be those that are going to be available at night or not yet? They'll be available until approximately 8.30, council member, okay. at, in the evening, okay. not overnight. Not overnight. But our goal at some point, perhaps next year, is to have somebody at night, maybe? I think we'll continue to generate that data, overnight okay. data, that where, where chat could have a possible intervention, and then we'll address that depending on the service demand. Okay, and then on the, on the second portion, I am not sure if you mentioned that if that you, or I've heard that before that it's really hard to find social workers right now, like people that would like. So is that your case as well? Like, are you seeing that like we could use more social workers, but we also where, Which, where do we find them? <laughs> I think I think it'd be interesting to hear from our social work manager who is in that population and just give you an idea of what we saw the first go around. Okay. So I'll ask Natasha to come up and just give give her experience. I'd like to hear that too. Thanks for the yeah, question. It's interesting. It's Thank interesting. You. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Natasha. Hi. Um, so you were asking whether it's hard to find social workers right now? How's that market? How's yeah. The desirable job. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do people want to do that job? Yes. I mean, there are a lot of um, websites that have alumni or recently graduating um, social workers who are looking for employment. And so I know where all of those are and how to access those. The first time when we were hiring, I felt like we had um, a lot of applicants. Okay. Um, we had 40 plus applicants. Um, and even one of our staff was adamant she wouldn't leave her job. She was not going to leave, but she would uh, appease me and meet with me and talk about the job. She is one of our social workers now. <laughs> so once she learned about this job and found out, and she was like, yep, and she has no regrets. She says all the time she's very happy. So we might run into some issues finding people, but I'm pretty optimistic. I think we have a really good program, and I think we can show that to people, and they'll want to be a part of it. Right. And the reason why I ask is because we do have the apprenticeship programs in other, you know, in IMS and in other areas or public services. But I was wondering if there would be a way to incentivize people to come and work for CHAT if we have those apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs or advertise heavily that the city does reimbursement for additional education if they were to become Salt Lake City employees. So they want to go to the next level into social working education hey, the city is interested in that as well. And anyway, it's just food for thought. If, you know, if we're having those issues, I would be happy to say, maybe we do an apprenticeship as well or some sort of um, incentive for people to get into that field stay. and join us at the fire department. We have the same thought, council member. So an internship program, maybe University of Utah, we're already in communication with them and that's already being developed. Okay, Great. there you go, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Council members, any more questions for the fire department budget? It was very clear, <laughs> the, the requests, so thank you. Um, okay, seeing none, I guess we'll move on. Thank you so much for being here, Chief. Thank you, Council. Team. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> All right. Well, look at that. We're 15 minutes ahead of schedule, even with our technology delays. Okay. Um, we are moving on to item number two, which is the fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget for that Department of Economic Development. Sylvia Richards from the Council Policy Analyst staff will be introducing this item. And then we have Lorena Rifo Jensen and Jake Maxwell from the Department of Economic Development here, as well as I see other people from the department in the background. Hi, Sylvia. Do you want to give us a quick introduction? I would love to. Thank you. Hi, Lorraine and Jake. Hello. The functions of the Department of Economic Development are twofold. The Business Support Division promotes local economic opportunities and business expansion by developing partnerships with communities and businesses, organizing events, and advocating for small and medium-sized businesses. Two of the funding programs which can assist businesses in the city include the Economic Development Loan Fund Program and the ARPA Community Grant Program. 
The proposed budget for the business support division shows a $191,559 or 7.9% increase over last year. Um, there are no FTEs pr proposed in this budget, so the number remains at 14 for that group. Next is the Arts Council Division, which supports artists and arts organizations to facilitate the development and expansion of art, the arts, as well as of awareness and access of the arts in the city. Uh, the Arts Council programs that the council members are familiar with yeah. include arts Artist in the Classroom, Arts Grants Program, Living Traditions Festival, and the Twilight Concerts. The proposed budget for the Arts Council shows a $147,912 or 14.4% increase over last year, and there are no new FTEs proposed in this budget either, so that remains at eight. And I'd like to turn the time over to Lorena and Jake now. Well, good Sylvia. afternoon. Good afternoon, Lorena. It is wonderful to see you, and thank you so much. I know that this is a long process for you, but we're excited to come in, um, before you. And thank you, Sylvia, uh, for working with us. I also want to say before we actually go into our presentation that from our perspective, this process is arduous, and everyone involved from the budget committee, the administration, everyone is on his best to ensure that we're asking for the right things and we're being fair to one another, especially with other sister agencies and with all the demands in our city. So basically our department, as you know, our mission is to focus on human-centered economic development. Therefore, we actually come together as a department, as a team of passionate professionals to build businesses, but also professional line a professional, uh, but also build um, a wonderful life for our residents. Um, we align our resources and streamline our processes to grow and nurture a city that can foster, so in order to foster gainful job creation, thriving business dis districts, neighborhoods, and ensure that we support our diverse arts and culture scenes that we have within our city. Um, with that, if we could go to the next slide. Um, then we can go to the next one. Um, as it was described, we have 22 staff members that provide this work for our city. And I have to say that in my professional life of 30 years, I have found an incredible team of passionate, committed individuals that support every single community, every single business district. So thank you to them for the work that they do. And our senior leadership is also here, and I want to thank them publicly. If we go to the next slide. With that said, um, as you will see in this slide, we have highlighted a few of our initiatives projects, and as Sylvia described, our um, different divisions that we have. Um, just to highlight a few under economic development, we have um, the Healthcare Innovation, the Youth Career Pathway, ARPA, Sister City Diplomacy, in terms of our Art Council, I mean, there's so many. We've been enjoying, of course, the Living Traditions. And um, tomorrow night is the first night for our Twilight Concert Series. And I believe Council Member Pui will be there to support that event. And many of you also may be joining us as well. Uh, but I do want to read, and I think in the words of our residents, uh, basically what these programs actually do. And, I, and the reason I focus on ARPA and the reason I focus on the Twilight Concert and the Arts Council is because we have had um, a member of our community who sent, and hopefully you have also received this, an incredible email outlining what these programs do and what does our economic development in conjunction with your support and, and the administration support what we're doing for our communities. Uh, this is from Mauro, uh, Salt Lake City, Capoeira, and this is what he stated. 
Uh, my Capo Water School attracts people from all walks of life in Salt Lake City, including underserved populations such as refugee, immigrants, and people of color. I've been told over and over again that the Capoeira community I created in Salt Lake City has provided a sense of belonging for people who fill this place. I received $2,250 from the Salt Lake City Arts Council. For my project, I organized a week of community workshops in African Brazilian arts, including Capoeira, and ended the week with a public performance of these arts. This gave me the opportunity to bring 18 artist guests from around the world, and the funding helped me cover some of the costs in bringing them to Salt Lake City. Programs and grants like this help me continue to provide the arts services and affordable rates for more vulnerable community members. I was also a recipient of the ARPA Community Recovering Assistant Grant. I follow closely through the process by viewing the public documentation and meetings, and I was so impressed with the ARPA Grant Committee. And as we know, that has come across in previously before, this committee, before the council. Along with the department um, that was willing to help us uh, with the application process, striving for equity and inclusivity in all their work. Um, I think it's important that I share these words with you because I can provide you a list of things that we do, but without the feedback of our community, we really don't know how well we're doing. And this is an example of when we come together, we have the arts, we have uh, we have the ARPA grants, we have your support, we have the administration. I think we're doing impactful things for Salt Lake City when it comes to its economic development and economic recovery. Um, I also did highlight the youth career pathway. As many of you know, last year, uh, November, I believe November, around November 10th, we came together with the Salt Lake School District, the Salt Lake Education Foundation, and some of our life sciences companies, Recursion and BioMario. And those companies opened their doors to ensure that our youth in our city have an opportunity to visit them and see what we're doing. So they could see themselves in those professions, whether they're scientists, whether they're project managers, and I'm just going to read two quotes, and I, I hope you don't mind it that I do this, but I think it's important for me to relate in the words of those students how they thought this program was affecting their lives. I greatly enjoy, and this is a young student, the first lab we visited. I felt very empowering and made the future seem hopeful. It seemed that there was a strong focus on how any, any of us could work there. I also like that so many people of respected positions chose to come and spend time with us. It made me feel like I was value to them and that they care deeply for us. Again, going back to being a human center, economic development department, um, the words of the people that we're serving, I actually believe are the ones who are telling us whether we're going in the right direction or not. So I just, and Jake will talk about more about the youth career pathway and the human uh, and the youth uh, summit later on. Next slide, please. Um, in order for the Department of Economic Development to continue in our mission, uh, we have come before council to request the support of uh, our request to the budget committee, which is $80,000. We haven't had a strategic plan. Uh, it's, I think the, the, the last strategic plan actually ended in 2020. We are a different um, community. We're a growing community, and it is the right time to do this. We can look at how um, you know, the priorities of the cities have changed, how we look uh, to the future. We can look at the organizational structure. We can look at the projects and programs that we are executing to ensure that they're meeting the needs of our business community, um, and that includes accords, the arts, um, as well as of our residents. So we're asking for $80,000 so we can continue in our journey 
to ensure that we have the right program strategies to continue building in Salt Lake City's future. Jake. Next slide, please. Okay, so Lorena covered the impact of this youth summit, but I can give a little bit more background about how it, um, we prioritize it in our department. So we're focused on healthcare innovation as an industry, um, but our business development d division also meets with hundreds of businesses every single year. And so we know what the good jobs are, we know the connections to the businesses, and we want to get those out in front of the youth of the city and uh, the residents. So the Youth Summit is intended to introduce students to the healthcare innovation industry, and we did that by having them tour two life science companies. They kicked it off with a mayor at Recursion. Um, they went to BioMariu, and we closed out the day at the BioHive Summit, where they got to do a STEM activity. Um, and then heard from uh, industry leaders from their own neighborhoods um, talking about their path to where they were. Um, so because of the feedback we got from the students, um, I'll also mention that we had 50 students, but we had to set a limit, a cap on how many students we could support to not overwhelm the businesses, and there was um, closer to 100 kids interested in going. Um, so this is just something that we want to continue to offer. Also, the makeup of the students that attended was very impressive. We had um, nearly half were girls and uh, half were from uh, an ethnic minority group. Um, on the healthcare innovation item, this is to support our strategic partnerships. So rather than uh, duplicating efforts, we really want to support the efforts that are successful in the community. Um, this comes from the Healthcare Innovation Blueprint to support the pillars um, st for strategic partnerships, brand promote grow, and increase investment. And so these partners listed here uh, help us to achieve those objectives. Next slide. And so here are our insights. Um, you can see the Healthcare Innovation Youth Summit was a must for us with a score of 14. Um, the Strategic Partnerships is a should with a score of 16. And our Strategic Plan was a must with a score of 8. Um, next slide. Okay. Thank you for having us. And we'll open it up to questions. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Councilman Pui. Yeah, quick, quick question. Um, thank you for all the work that you guys do. I, um, I there is no, there's no secret about uh, my support for this, uh, for your leadership and for this department as, as a whole. Um, I believe that uh, you know the the need to foster, facilitate, and support current and future businesses is key to this city. Uh, and in whatever form uh, this they come from art, you know, artists to gigantic multinational companies in our, in, in my district. So um, and connecting them with the resources. So the summit is, is something that I'm very interested in. Uh, the youth summit that you guys uh, just did. Uh, and what is uh, in general? I know that this is a little bit beyond the money ask or you know the budget specific, but. What what did we learn about that? What are the next steps? You know, is this something that, in general, seems to be worth to keep on doing? But how do we uh, measure success on this program? Um, I just, uh, in general, and I'm not talking about this, but in general, I tend to not uh, struggle with programs that are feel-good programs. Right? It's oh, we feel good about doing this, but what is this specific? Uh, goal that we are trying to achieve and how we are measuring that. And the second part is related to the Arts Council um, and related to some of the budget com uh, complications we had uh, earlier this year and how do we prevent that from happening uh, this next year uh, coming up because uh, that was uh, complicated. Uh, I hope that that doesn't happen uh, again. So those two, thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Council Member Pui. I think those are great questions. Um, I'm going to turn the time to Jake who can address the issues you raised regarding how do we measure performance. We completely agree with you. Uh, so he'll, he'll talk about that and then we can discuss the second question related to the Arts Council. 
So in conjunction with the Youth Summit, we've been working with the school district on building out their biotech CTE program, and they've been doing that. Um, they now have 70 kids signed up for fall semester, and we are also trying to help hold together partnerships um, to continue to fund that. So Talent Ready Utah meets with us weekly as well. The State Board of Education uh, joins that as well to make sure that the strands and standards are in place. Um, and Talent Ready Utah is hoping to help fund that. Um, this youth summit is a way for us to really introduce the industry to kids and to inspire them. Um, we were intentional about who the businesses put in front of the kids so that they could see themselves in those roles. Um, and so we're hoping to spark an interest and now with this biotech CTA offering, there's a way for them to continue to interact with the industry. Bringing them to the Biohive Summit was also intentional so that the businesses could see that these kids were interested in those jobs. And so with the biotech course being in place now, we now have a, uh, an area for businesses to continue to interact with the kids. That's What's incredible. a CTE? I'm sorry, Career and Technical Education. For high school students? Yep, for high school okay. students. Um, and then the second question, Councilman Pujol. Sure. Um, I also want to say that Felicia Baca, our director, division director for the Arts Council, is also here. And I just want to convey that thank you for that question. Um, I think uh, it's, it's very timely. I want to assure you that we have done a lot of work uh, to ensure that this doesn't happen again. There is a policy and procedure that we've worked um, uh, with Felicia side by side. We've also worked with our finance department, Mary Beth, um, who has reviewed that. Uh, her board, meaning Felicia's um, Arts Council board, has also reviewed many of the steps. She's also engaged a consultant. Uh, so I will ask Felicia to come up and provide a little bit more detail. But we've done a lot of work to ensure to all of you and to Council Poi that uh, we're putting basically, uh, you know, uh, ensuring that we have everything set up so it doesn't happen again. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I would just add and concur with everything that, <clears throat> excuse me, that Lorena said. And um, we are working directly with, with Mary Beth on this issue um, to ensure one of, one of the um, things I'd like to explain that occurred is that with the Arts Council Foundation and the division, we have to put our in-kind projections of staff into that foundation budget. And those numbers were not updated in the foundation budget, but the Arts Council Foundation did not actually exceed any available funds, but because there was a data entry error in that audit of the Arts Council Foundation and the cities, it created an audit finding. So we have put procedures in place to make sure those numbers are updated and, and calculated dates with Mary Beth on budget amendment processes and confirming those numbers with her. Thank you. Yeah. Council members, any other questions? Councilman Valdemoros. Well, thank you, Lorena. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Yeah, you're good. I'm, a, I'm excited about this, Lorena. I'm excited spe specifically with the Department of Economic Development Strategic Plan. Yeah. You know, it's very, very important. So I remember when I was an intern, sorry, I keep repeating this, but Salt Lake City's economic development what consisted of one senior advisor to that mayor at the time, a small business manager and the intern. That was the capital city economic development group division. This is um, 2005, 2006. So to me, that told me that at that time, there's not a lot of interest or priorities for economic development in, you know, in the capital city. Like there wasn't really like a, like a focus on it, right? But look at, look at us, you know, 20, almost 20 years later, where we're at. And so I'm super excited. And also look at your budget numbers. Like look at, look at how much they spend a year or how much the department costs, like $4 million. This is like the capital city economic development investment. Like, in, you know, 
like in you know taxpayers money compared to the other departments i think this is pretty low you know in my opinion it's pretty low even though we're in a great position you have a lot of stuff and, and obviously the focus is on economic development so i'm excited for the strategic plan to tell us is this number making the impact that solid cities budget needs overall you know with your department like is this something that we need to increase because we need return on investment you know to cover our our um our cost here and also you know and and, and improve and, and grow as a city as a capital city so i'm super excited about this strategic plan so what i'm trying to say i think you guys do a great job i think um we just need to not refocus just like go over what what what, what has worked and what we need to improve on, so it's amazing. But I, in, in the presentation, I would like to add, you know, that, um, that taxpayer, oh, sorry, that tax return, I would like it to be included in the strategic plan so that we know. If we invest this much in an economic development strategy in the next five years, this is what we can expect as a city to return, um, you know, for our budget in general, whether it be more, um, we focus more on small, you know, small businesses, or, or we or we need to know how to invest so we can have a better return as an economic development strategy for the city. That's what I would like to see, because sometimes it creates confusion. Are these feel good projects, or are we really impacting what we really need to get done here? You know, um, so I think having those numbers would be great. Um, what else I was going to say? And with the rest, I, I, with the rest, I think I'm. Pretty cool, so I'm excited to see where, where we go. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Councilor Dugan? Mr. Chair, thank you. And I, nice comments, I agree wholeheartedly on that, so that's a great th idea. There's just one question from the staff report about the mitigation funds for uh, construction projects, and there's no increase to the funding for this coming year. So, I, because I, uh, last year I guess we added another $200,000. So I'm just assuming that we're, we feel good on, on construction projects going throughout the city and we have enough to, to, to offset those uh, pains of the, the local small businesses. Um, I think that's, that's a really fair question and it's a great question and we appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I started my comments today with saying how difficult this process is and, you know, all the needs that we have. And whenever economic development comes to the table, which is, I agree with Council Member Valdemotos when it comes to strategic plan, we're a different city, our economy is different even after the pandemic, therefore this is the right time to get that done. Uh, I think that the Budget Committee did an incredible job and the best number was put forward. And yet having said that, there's a lot more projects. Uh, one of the questions that came to us, um, that Sylvia sent to us was, uh, you know, is, is this enough? We did an analysis that was based on the number of businesses from previous project, and I think we calculated about 15% of them apply, and we came up with a higher number. Uh, so we did come, after we did our analysis, we did come up with a higher number, um, uh, than the 200,000. Uh, therefore, that also includes that we have more projects coming up, one of them being downtown Salt Lake City, which the demand is going to be huge there. We have Sure House. And by word of mouth, the team going out there, uh, the program has become well known. Therefore, we are having more businesses asking for this funds, this grant funds. Um, as of believe April 17th, we have already exhausted all the funds, the $200,000 for the projects that we had last year. So. Lisa Schaefer, Chief Administrative Officer. Hi, thank you, Council Chair, and thank you, Council, for the question. I feel like I need to come up here and yes, save, save my friend. She's <laughs> trying to be really nice. We only budgeted $200,000, which is the same amount that was budgeted last year, just because of balancing the budget and budget constraints, and you know how that all goes. Certainly, if there is more available funding, uh, this would be a great place to add funding. Construction right now is raging. And uh, yeah, well, approximately we'll, we'll spend we'll spend some more if you're able to find funding. Do we know approximately what time in like how far into the fiscal year the previous year's two hundred thousand dollars 
sort of ran out or at what point we had to slow down some of those business related construction mitigation processes? The, um, the $200,000 that was allocated for fiscal year 23 ran out in April. I think you just said That's that, right? Correct. Oh, yeah. sorry. I, no, yeah. do not worry. No, I, I, I was wondering <laughs> if you were asking for the previous year. No, nope, that, okay. that just yes. missed it. So April. Yeah. April. So we're out of funding currently, and that was the $200,000. And, and what my friend is saying here is that that was with the, the construction season at the time. We actually have added more construction projects uh, in this fiscal year. So it, the, the pressure on that, the demand on that fund will be great this year. I, can we flag that as a, a potential addition, if depending on when we get our final numbers? And the, the question would be, uh, what is that extra money you, we gave for you to? So that's two thirds, two thirds. So are you asking for another third? So another? We we could analyze that. I think that that uh, your team did some work around how much you think w might be reasonable, and I can't remember what um, that is off the top of my head. Roberta I, um, Reichel um, and her team they run this grants program, and we requested half a million based on the percentage of businesses that have applied previously, and that was the number. Yeah. So three hundred thousand dollars more than what we have there. Okay. So we funded at two hundred. She she believes based on that analysis that we could Scale. potentially it, use five hundred. It's not I mean it's not all or nothing, right? It's right. it's whatever number it sounds like up to five hundred thousand you are confident you could use. Yes. It's all correct. helpful. It's all helpful. But, but if we can add a hundred it's it's all it's all helpful. Okay. Yes. Oh anything is helpful. It's not, <laughs> this yeah. point for Lisa. So Lisa it seems like the economic development group is the one that manages the funds yes, and then do. is there any other department that actually is doing the work out there like people doing the streets and the repairs is there anywhere in their budget that they can also help add to this this need that we have so that and the reason why I'm saying is like wow economic development is doing it like we're giving them but I'm thinking they there it must be somewhere else, like where we can. Large pull projects up. have business mitigation funds. It, like the Third West project had some okay. money built into its into budget it, right. for business mitigation. Is that correct? You are correct, Council Member. And that those um, those funds that are built into those large projects are about things like signage and access. This fund is completely different. This oh, fund okay. is about helping to offset costs that are due to construction in front of your building. So, like, I had to. So change my delivery times and that costs more money or whatever. Right. Huh. Okay. Now you're engaging someone to do social media for you or you're doing social media. You, you have to buy software to ensure that your clients know when and where, how to get to your business. Got it. All right. Okay, thanks. So the, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, I, Council members, any more questions on that? I have a question uh, from the arts, for the arts council again. Thanks, Council. Um, Thank you. Iconic art on the west side. What does that mean? What can we expect? Is that enough money? Am I getting my whale tail? Uh, can, <laughs> can the whale tail be at Ninth been, West and Ninth South? Be dreaming about the brine line <laughs> and the whale tail. And the whale tail, um, exactly. You know, it's going to be hard to top our existing iconic work of art. <laughs> it's a we tall can do order. It. We can do it. Um, so um, what we're currently doing is um, public art program manager Renato Olmedo Gonzalez has been working with a number of different city departments and community engagement on developing a survey that went live yesterday. And so this year, that goal for the iconic work of art is really working on um, what are the community's hopes. And, and wishes for this. So the survey asked kind of a number of questions about what art inspires you, what do you think of about your neighborhood, um, in particular, of course, in districts one and two. And so we're really doing site determination and community engagement and outreach this year. And so the 150,000, it's 150 in the budget, right, for that? I believe in the CIP, but we also are looking at the bond sites, which have public art funds dedicated right. to them as well and we partner um, and execute projects for the redevelopment agency as well and so we're we're considering all sites that constitute the west side but the hundred and fifty thousand that's being requested in this fiscal year's budget for your division is for that's just for the engagement or within uh, my understanding is that there's CIP funds yeah, in that total in so there's budget. nothing in in our department or division all those public art dollars sit oh, in CIP been, okay are they percentage for art 
dollars? Yes. Yeah. So they're allocated. I believe so. Part of the statute. So the percentage for our dollars in the CIP fund is being allocated. I would want to confirm that with yeah, Mary Beth because um, I don't know if she's here. But I feel like Jennifer yeah. is also someone else who, or Cindy. Do you know the Jen? Okay. Do you do you know anything about the? Are, is the percentage for art allocated automatically into the CIP fund? And then that's what we're proposing to use for this? I think it's a separate line item for this. The percent for art is in this year calculated separately from CIP. I think previously it was, and that means there's more essentially for it. Great. There's also the line item in the RDA budget. For Did I make this? up one hundred and fifty thousand dollars? No. I think it, no. I think it I was one hundred and fifty. <laughs> oh, no, it's correct. Yes, okay. I think and so. One of the suggestions that we had was. Um, if the council wanted to weigh in on whether those funds should be combined for a larger piece or if there are multiple pieces that that would be better. How much did the whale cost? <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. And how much we estimated tail cost? I think is that, is that <laughs> well, about $120,000. Um, and with inflation, I would say that project was um, underbid. So we're, we're looking to aim higher than that. Does that include artist fees? Assembly. Uh, wow. It's actually a really good deal. That's amazing. <laughs> 120. And um, we, uh, I believe that number is 150, and then the CIP percent for art is a, is a different number. Well, I'll just but say, I that's think not determined yet. the whale is amazing, oh, and I love the whale. You. And the it's just like, the gift that keeps on giving. But, but, yeah. but, it, but I think so the west side right deserves something as good or better. Yeah. I think the, the west whale. side should be deferred to, and if we want to tell people to kiss our tail, that should be our option. <laughs> <laughs> kiss our tail. I'm sorry. But, um, that's funny. I'm excited for that. We will do our best. Request. Yeah. So this chair. <laughs> but a follow up on this. Uh, obviously, you know, I've been talking to your, you and the, your department about art on the west side yes. from you know way back in the day. It feels like a million years ago. It probably was last year at some point. <laughs> obviously, it was last year at some point. I um, one of the staff questions relates to maintenance. Yes. Um, and I yeah. would like to uh, because adding these beautiful pieces of art that are. Everybody has an opinion about it, and that's what art is supposed to do, uh, right? To create some sort of emotion. Some people had all sorts of interesting reactions to it. Yes. Um, but maintenance is very important to, to this and how we are uh, going to look in the future to, to maintain them. So what is the department uh, process on this? Yeah, let me tell you a little bit about that. So a couple of years ago, um, we sort of got a seed fund for uh, public art maintenance and changed the ordinance to allocate 10 to 15 percent of CIP funds annually for public art projects. Um, that was absent before and we often worked with our partners in parks to repair works of art. Um, you now have an annual report that's kind of commensurate from the mayor on what um, will be fixed in the coming year before the allocation is made. So that fund balance of about $200,000 was, um, will be at the end of this fiscal year almost entirely expended on repairs and you'll get a report that will be forthcoming in July on that with the CIP process. So we're back to having a balance that's just the 10 to 20 percent of CIP which will um, not fix all the works that are, are on our list for the collection. So we plan to be working with the finance department on looking at how to, to potentially make a line item ask in the future because those funds will be expended very rapidly again on works of art and are also not eligible to um, care for our two-dimensional works of art in the city. So there's a need. Thank you. Yeah. And we're working on it. <laughs> I see no more questions. Thank you so much for what you do for our community. Thanks. There oh. was one question that you raised in our, some of the questions that you raised that were sent to us. Um, wanted to make sure that we answer all of them. That was the special assessment area. And wanted to just bring it up if you needed, wanted to discuss that. Is there a new that? special assessment area proposed right now or it's just the discussion about the process of creating special assessment areas? Um, we have been encouraging the administration to come back with a plan to address the all of the small business nodes that are interested in having um, improvements. And 
um, trash pickup and services and that type of a thing. And I think you were saying that you are managing the the two, this the um, downtown alliance and sugar. Oh, sugar house is one or is it not? Sugar house. There we've done the uh, pre work before we actually put one out. We're going to be coming back, sending a transmittal on that. We have received a letter from Granary, and we've also heard that potentially North Temple uh, will be somehow, some, sometime in the future, requesting for us to potentially look at, at a pre-review assessment process of a uh, special assessment area. Yeah. So, so all of the areas at various times have asked about how they can get services, how their, um, their needs can be met in terms of um, extra cleanup or garbage pickup or nicer amenities, that type of a thing. So right now the administration has done quite a bit of work looking at that, but they're, as far as I know, and Lisa could tell us for sure, but I don't think they're ready to make a proposal of a system but um, that could be coming your way if you are interested in learning more. Uh, this department has said that you probably don't have capacity to manage more. Um, no, we, we don't have capacity. And, you know, we like to perform at a high level. And these are very extensive in terms of the process, and we want to do them well. So as they continue, if the requests continue to come, there may be, there will be a need for us to have you know, a FTE position eventually. We, yeah. Do we look at sales tax generated in terms of what level of service is given to certain areas? No. That's never considered? No. It was probably an original consideration for the downtown and Sugar House, but we haven't done any other districts. Um, and, and there's probably some legal equity issues that that need to be looked at as part of this process. but. Well, certainly. I mean, I think the special assessment area is a good tool for when certain areas want additional mm -hmm. services for, for business notes. But I also, I, in terms of a policy discussion, I think I'm not opposed to looking at sales tax revenue generated in terms of like, there's a lot of business activity happening in this area. There might be more garbage produced in that area. So maybe we pick up the garbage. And the ones that we're being asked, they're economic promotions, like the downtown ones is economic promotion. It's not for, I, yeah. I, and I think that the whole, I mean, if assuming we are going to have this policy discussion at some point, I think having all of those things considered, because I think b different business districts ask for different, different things. Different things, that's some correct. Some want better art or better lighting or gardening, landscaping, things like that. <laughs> Can I, can I ask, is there an SAA designation, and I get that we have um, issues with the port overlay, but for instance, we meet with people down in, um, like near the Sweets Candy area, who have various needs. Is there something for maybe business districts that aren't so reliant on foot traffic and people buying goods, but who are nonetheless economic engines and actually are what keeps this, not property taxes, what keep the city running? Is there an option for them to have an SAA if they choose to? So the SAAs are always based on the number of property owners requesting, um, and they usually come to you as well as council members for the respective districts. So once they, per se, in the granary, we received a letter, they said, you know, we, this is something we want to do, they will be reaching out to Council members, I believe three, three of you are part of that granary district. And then what we do is uh, meet with them, analyze, and then often there is a request to do the pre-work that needs to be done. Um, in that we come to you and request for a budget amendment. I think for Sugar House it was $60,000. And in that case it was the Sugar House Chamber, the Community Council there, um, as well as a local alliance, I can't think of their name, but they came together and requested the funding that you allocated to, to have that work done. So we hired a consultant, they did the work, and now we're in the next phase where we're gonna be coming back to you to present the findings and moving forward. I think this is a powerful tool, especially for unlikely places. Our, our warehouses and everything to the west require this. But I also just wanna say thank you. Your work 
means that housing stays affordable because revenue streams you innovate take the pressure off of property owners. Your work makes sure that our constituents are employed with dignity Thank and you. have economic mobility. We know that economic development does not happen by ex accident. The only thing that happens by accident is economic exploitation. So I love that you all take such a proactive, protective stance for our homeowners, for our constituents, for the people who come in from the suburbs to work here, and that you're creating a vibrant city that I want my kids to call home one day where they can find meaningful employment for themselves. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you so much. It's an honor to have the opportunity to do this. Thank you for your Thank service. Thank you. Um, Council, we are at 212. Do we have the representatives from the attorney's office here, or should we go to break early? Break. Okay. We are scheduled at 234 attorney's office. Right, I think we need to yeah, wait for wait. for the district attorney. Um, so why don't we go to break right now? Or do you want to start with unresolved issues or go to break now and then just start unresolved issues? I have, I have a lot of issues, so. <laughs> we, yeah, we, we all do. Um, okay, do we want to start that? I, I'm fine either way. Our break was is scheduled for after the attorney's office, so we could either just do it now and then okay. power or through after, now. or okay. start unresolved issues. Yes. Let's just start unresolved start issues. Unresolved that issue. sounds like what we're doing. I think I printed out um, a new sheet, but since the printing of that sheet, we've added two items. <laughs> so, I know, I think we just, there's no way around that. So, um, there are two documents where we're tracking unresolved issues. One is the document that's, um, I think, printed out in front of you, which is the latest version of this tracking sheet. You'll notice that there are three columns across to the right. Uh, and the reason that we've done that is that some of the items can be funded with things that are not the general fund, right? So, um, for example, uh, quite a few of the housing items, so, or in fact, all of the housing ideas, um, starting on line 22, could be uh, funded either with RDA funding or dormant housing funds. Um, I sent some of that information to you guys uh, last night, and the updated Unresolved Issues staff report has that item as well. So we can go through um, those items. Uh, maybe that would actually help to be, if we could do that later, because I'm not prepared for <laughs> that discussion right this second. Um, but I was going to go over the additional Unresolved Issues that came up just in the last uh, couple of uh, discussions. So we've added on the list that you won't see on your sheet um, a line item for construction mitigation funding and economic development. And we've put a placeholder of $300,000, although based on the discussion, it sounds like that amount is scalable. And so if, you know, $100,000 is available, that that would be fine. The um, next item that we've added, and this is based on new information from the administration that was shared just before the meeting, that um, uh, based on some uh, increased collaboration between PD and compliance, and in response to a few council members asking questions about what are the city's tools to enforce on RV that are parked longer than the allowable area. Um, they are proposing, or they, they put together a proposal that's not in the budget, but the council could add it if you wanted to, um, called an RV compliance team. And it would be three FTEs and a vehicle. So of the $398,000, it would be three ninety eight for the fiscal year 24 budget, $398,000. Some of that money would be one-time money, so um, because it includes a vehicle, so not all of that money would be needed on an ongoing basis. So, we're asking um, them for some follow-up information on that. How many FTEs? Three. Three yes. ongoing FTEs mm -hmm. doing um, outreach. And, and maybe Lisa can um, jump up. My understanding is that their primary. Uh, purpose would be to encourage RVs to move along, right? If RVs have been parked in one area for a very long time. Lisa, do you have some key points of what they would do? <laughs> Thanks. 
Yes, that is correct. And I am probably not going to articulate this as well as probably Julie Crookston or Jorge Chamorro could. Um, I've asked them to send me some information right now, and they're diligently working on that. The ongoing cost would be 325. So it's I think it's 61 in, in one time uh, is how that works out, 60 something in, in one time. Uh, yes, their, their primary purpose would be to enforce the streets for storage ordinance and do that on a more regular basis. There are over 100 vehicles in their queue right now. And so this would help to sort of help people move along, but more than that, it would be making sure that our compliance officers who are hired to do compliance activities, including, you know, downtown activation of the streets, making sure that the traffic is, is moving, writing parking tickets, helping out with our crossing guards and all of those are available for that function. So it's kind of a two, two, uh, two-sided thing. So it's it's increasing the um, compliance on the streets for storage ordinance, and it's also freeing up compliance officers that are currently pulled off their duties to do that now. Mr. Chair? Okay, but none of the funding is to, well, Councilmember Pui, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I guess to give you a little background from my side of, of the story, uh, obviously the amount of uh, uh, notes and uh, messages from neighbors on related to RVs uh, is, is very high, uh, especially in my part of town, but I'm sure all of us hear it. Um, and the impact on the neighbors is great. Um, and uh, and we, you know, we have an ordinance on the book, and it is fair to say that we have to find the common ground to enforce these rules, but at the same time, be fair to those that are living on the RVs. But the impacts are great, and right now we don't have the resources to enforce on this uh, as ac as we we have it on the books, and as a body that uh, legislates and creates this uh, this. Uh, uh, book of ordinances, uh, we have to also give the administration the tools to enforce uh, on, on those. I, uh, I also wanted to connect this with what my original intent was related to the Blackwater vouchers, uh, which, you know, is part of this unresolved list, is, is giving this being an opportunity for those uh, telling them, uh, telling those that are, that are living on RBs, hey, this here's a voucher to go dump your water, your black water, if you if you need one, um, and and this is the, the the resources that are around. And I'm hoping that if if we can fund this, we can connect it with all the other parts of the of the system that the city is doing with the chat team and all these other uh, resources, uh, so we can actually help those individuals that are living in our streets uh, or in RV. So that's my background on this issue. I, I appreciate the administration coming up with an idea and a plan on this. Um, so I, I hope that that helps uh, understanding uh, what this where this come from. I guess. I'm, this is the first time hearing of these three FTEs, so I'm not yet uh, have not yet wrapped my hand or head around it. But I'm, my first question is why would we be increasing the compliance team rather than adding to the heart team that could act? And like I think the money for the Blackwater remediation, or I just don't see the point in more money to get people to move along when there's nowhere for them to go. Um, and I'd rather put the resources into teams that would help get those individuals connected with the things that they need. And I'm not sure that that is the heart team or not, but it seems to me like I'd rather focus energy in that area than. Which is true also that there is not enough resources in any of the other pieces of the equation. And we have no control about, in many cases, we have no control on, on housing uh, in, in many cases. So. I, again, this is a, a good debate for us to have and a good conversation. I uh, I feel like we need to do something on that side of, of the enforcement side because, again, many of our uh, code enforce uh, people are, are pulled into this issue and not able to enforce in other parts of our code, so it creates a big gigantic jam on the system, and I hope that I that's correct. Yeah, that, that is correct. I would, I would like to say I hurriedly asked Jorge to come up. So he's behind 
uh, me if, if you want to ask him some questions, he would have a better way to answer those. And also, I just want to make it super clear that um, your point is very, very right on. Um, and, and we are not doing this in terms of just the compliance team only. This is a multi-departmental effort to try and address this specific issue. The heart team is absolutely involved, and Andrew can talk about that. Thanks. Go ahead, Andrew. The, you're right about the bigger picture is there's not a place to go. That, that's true. That's part of the reason we've got 100 plus vehicles across the city that are across the city but predominantly moving west of I-15 for the most part. Um, it's less occupied. There's more open space, bigger streets with fewer folks on them, those kind of things. The current effort that's happening for winter overflow next, next winter to have six to 800 beds for winter that's also sort of meshed with Wayne Niederhauser's work on another emergency shelter location as soon as this year, but figuring out where to put that in the land. That is a good answer to where to go, combined with the housing pieces. So there is a pilot that will be part of the former Ramada for parking. So there are some efforts to move to more solutions. This is an effort from the city and to say, we still need to help folks not entrench in one location or multiple locations um, because what happens there is you set up a vehicle, the vehicle who towed you there leaves potentially, um, and then you set up a camp essentially in multiple locations. And it's very difficult because right now compliance is going out because it's a parking issue because we have a 48 hour parking ordinance, right? right? They go out, they can enforce two days a week, usually Tuesdays and Thursdays, but you can sort of do the math 48 hours, you do the notice you can't catch them the next time or we can't get somebody out there to help immediately it becomes weeks and weeks so this is one effort to try and do an intervention because for the most part when they're smaller encampments of folks who are parking a couple of vehicles when they're given notice and we come back to enforce on the 48 hours they, they leave voluntarily they move so part of it is helping just keep the movement and keeping compliance with the court and ordinance there could be a further discussion, obviously, from the council about the ordinance itself, because our current ordinance never envisioned occupied vehicles this way. Um, and so we don't have anything specific to that. Um, so I think there'd be some appetite to look at that as well as part of this. But then you're right, we're still working on that ultimate solution of where they can go legitimately. I guess, I'll, I guess for me, the three additional FTEs feels like a big... Um, a big budgetary item that it is setting a policy direction, and I, I, I'm not yet ready to say that that's the policy direction I'm comfortable with, but do, do we need to look at this issue holistically? Yes. Councilman Petro. So I'm so incredibly torn on this because I'm one of the people who's talking to any team that will pick the phone up for me because this is this is huge, and it's, it's schools and the duress under which the people who are occupying these vehicles, it, it's increasing, and I am seeing increased tensions between the people who are forced to live in their vehicles and the neighbors around them. Um, notably, we have at least one school that goes K through eight where parents and the people inhabiting the vehicles have gotten into altercations, and it's the parents calling me, telling me that this happened. So I see this as a huge issue, and compliance has to happen. We have to be able to let our kids go to school and drop them off without, you know, conflict but do we have any timeline on when there's a place to go I feel like right. the investment to me is sound but I hate the idea of it being a Sisyphus sort of trying to push a rock up a hill kind of thing do we have I, I know I'm probably asking for blood from a turnip by asking you this question especially on the public record but I do need to ask it in terms of a policy direction and in terms of making sure our investment does what we're hoping it, it will is there anything on, do we have any sort of timeline on the horizon for when we can stop pushing the peas around the plate and like, you know, get them to a destination? The first answer is probably there is a deadline of this year for winter. We have that every year, obviously. This year, the numbers are larger. So October is when that six to 800 beds should be available, depending on where it's located. Okay, so that's one. As far as the year-round 24-7 option that we've been working with Wayne Niederhauser on, there is initial funding for it. There's direction to go and do it. Uh, they're working from the state end about the process to get consultants and get a 
um, a provider essentially to do it. The big issue right now is just finding land, so he's actively pursuing that, and I don't have a time frame for when he'll find the right piece of property. It may coincide with the current efforts with the comm process um, for winter overflow because they're looking at similar properties across the entire county, so it could go together and work well this summer and locate multiple properties that could be useful. I just don't have a firm timeline for that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm torn like, like Victoria said, but you know, what was easier for me to understand earlier in one of the, the fire presentations, the fire department presentation said, these are the calls, this is how many we were able to do, and this is how many we couldn't do. So this is how we can solve this portion here with four more FTEs. We have the SLC mobile app, so it would be easier for me, for education purposes, to say, hey, we get calls and SOC mobile app and you know all of this related to RVs this many times a week, and we can only help move this many people, and we've been able to give resources to this many people and so on. But if we had three more FTEs, this is where we would have them go, or this is how we can help, or and then even with that information, we can also look at holistically and say, okay, maybe we don't need three FTs. Maybe we need to put that money into a place where they can actually go and park altogether. That's a designated spot for RVs for parking. So it's That's easy for everybody to understand from our staff compliance, the public. Hey, you have an RV. You need there's a place for you to go park, but you can't be parking in you know in a, in a residential area where there's only 48 hours uh, of parking allowed and on top of uh, some things that are happening that shouldn't be happening right outside, you know, uh, right on the sidewalk or on the street where cleanup is difficult, where all of the things that we see in the street. So maybe I can wrap my head around if I had better information of how many people. I believe they said happening. that you guys have some some of that, don't you? Yeah, we have. Uh, hi. Hi. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> For the record, Jorge Chamorro, Director of Public Services, and we have we had this uh, this uh, same conversation this morning. And yes, there is a log currently that has scheduled resources for the next month and a half, because we're addressing it on Tuesday and Thursday with the coordination of Hart and PD to show up to these locations. So we have already booked uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays for the next six weeks. And everything that comes in the next six weeks will be just added to the list. So yes, we have a report and we can share it with council as to where the locations are, the size of, of, of uh, these encampments, as well as the, the small ones that, that appear in multiple places as well. And when I refer to small ones, it's one or two vehicles. And large ones, we're talking about anywhere from five to 12 or the most recent one around uh, Wallace Stegner, 32 vehicles were involved. So those are the ones that require the most uh, attention. Now, in terms of what this team would be doing, uh, I just want to remind uh, Council that compliance has, uh, the, the core function of them is to enforce parking across the city, uh, including meter enforcement, including this 48 hour um, parking restriction in, in public roads. The most demanding one is, is the 48 hour. Why? Because you need to show up, document the vehicle, and come back later uh, in two days to confirm that the vehicle has moved and is now in compliance or not. So it's a, it's a two visit, right? Um, and they may be in compliance, which is very simple for, the, for, for a vehicle to be in compliance, they just need to move. Um, and that's, that's the part that we enforce. But following up allows us to maintain that movement to lessen the impact on one location that has been considered vulnerable, right? And I agree. I think this is a very good point, Mr. Chair. Sorry, I, um, it, it, it's easy. I mean, I obviously, as you probably know by now, uh, the issue uh, related to those that are on shelter is very important to me. I mean, I've been pushing for a sanction campaign since day one, uh, RV camping, you know, probably also for day one. But we need to figure out how to 
um, minimize the impact to all the neighbors. And the fact that many of these RVs are in the west side of Salt Lake City, uh, it, it is an impactful great in, in the neighbors that don't need it the most, if you wish, right? The, the neighbors that are struggling with, with all sorts of other uh, challenges, uh, and we need them to move. Um, and they can go uh, legally a couple blocks away or across the street or whatnot, and, and then you know reset the timer. Um, but the idea is that many of my neighbors are telling me this is happening, no one is doing anything, I'm dealing with, I have kids, they need to go to school, I cannot take them, uh, there is garbage everywhere, uh, something needs to happen. So there needs to be a mechanism to enforce our own uh, things on the book, and I believe that this is a good uh, first step towards that direction. Obviously, uh, as you can see, in un, uh, you know, in unresolved issues, there is a line 28, which you know, I've been pushing forward, which is sanctioned camping uh, as a grant. But so I, you know, I'm not seeing this as a, when you said about holistically, I think we are trying to see this as holistically. And the state and the administration has been working very hard to get the state on board and the state allocated money for this. I feel like we need to push more. But the fact is many cities around us are enacting RB laws, uh, which creates a bigger problem in our residents. And Again, a bigger, even a bigger problem on West Side residents, in my opinion. Okay. Um, is, are there any last comments on this? Okay, so let's move on to the attorney's office and then we come back to unresolved issues after the break. Can I say, while we're transitioning, thank you, administration, for hearing us so clearly and bringing a potential step towards a resolution. Sylvia, you have an introduction for us. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The City Attorney's Office budget includes three divisions, the Civil Practice, Recorder's Office, and Risk Management, as well as a contract with the County District Attorney's Office to manage the Prosecutor's Office. The proposed budget request uh, requests an increase of 1.3 million or 11%. Um, and that's mainly attributed to three factors, which includes the proposed ad addition of two new FTEs, the 5% salary increase, and the proposed $200,000 increase in salaries for the city prosecutor's office attorneys. And if approved, the FTE uh, number of FTEs will be 605 the two new positions are one new assistant city prosecutor position, Miami model, and one new special project analyst and automation position in the recorder's office. And as council members are aware, there's been um, some discussion about sal salary parity among city prosecutors, county prosecutors, and legal defenders. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Katie. Hello, City Council members. I'm Katie Lewis, the Salt Lake City Attorney, and I'm joined by Sim Gill, who serves as the City Prosecutor, Ralph Chamness, the Chief Deputy District Attorney, and Paul Fuller. Uh, they'll come up later. We actually have two slideshows, the City Attorney's Office, PowerPoint, and then the Prosecutor's Office. And I thought I would give my presentation and then give you a brief introduction about the relationship between the district attorney's office and the city prosecutors and then hand the rest of the time over to sim ralph and paul for their presentation so if we could start my city attorney's office slideshow that would be great and while we're waiting um, I'll start by saying the city attorney's office is in a unique position because we represent all departments in the city and both branches of government um, we have a, a few divisions, our exceptional recorder's office, led by Cindy Lou Trishman, who has really transformed that division into a sophisticated service provider that it is um, really committed to transparency. Uh, I have a leadership team of four division chiefs, 
Kimberly Chitris, Jonathan Papasideris, Katie Nichols, and Deputy City Attorney Mark Cottrell. And they are my right hands. That's right, I have four right hands. <laughs> and we couldn't do the great work we do without their leadership. And then we also have a new risk manager, Lori Roberts, who came from Murray City and is bringing a wealth of energy and expertise to our risk division. So thank you, we can go to next slide. This tells you a little bit about our internal service provider department. We are big city attorneys with a small staff of lawyers and we are involved in every aspect of what the city does. We save the city money, we protect the city, we engage with the public in every department. And I would love for all of you to think about every issue that you all are working on and every headline you see in the Salt Lake Tribune or other newspaper, and I can just about guarantee that my office is involved in it. We are a high, highly trained and skilled professionals and I'm really proud of our team. Next slide. These are our three budget requests um, that are supported in the, the mayor's recommended budget for a total of $187,000 and some change. Next slide. Our first um, request is for $55,000 for some office structure and redesign. Um, we have a culture of collaboration and in ensuring that all of our city attorneys advise the city as a whole and aren't siloed into the departments or divisions they represent. And part of that is requiring those attorneys to be in the office and collaborate with each other. And on the fifth floor, you, you may be surprised to know that we don't have a sink or running water other than the bathrooms and the drinking fountain. And so these, this budget request is for us to have a break room and to also have some paint uh, in our offices so that when we invite people from the outside or other professionals that they uh, don't see our cracked walls. So thank you very much for supporting us, uh, all of our professionals with that request. I'm not sure what happened to my slideshow, but I can... We're asking for a lot, Katie. Yeah, I Water know. And Just, paint. I know, and maybe an ice machine. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. If you have any questions, I, I can I could take you up there. I thought attorneys didn't need any of that, but I we know. have that, um, especially government attorneys. No, we don't uh, usually. But um, so the the question is: uh, Is there related? Was the crack wall related to the earthquake, and is that is that part of the process of? Being repaired now? We have been informed that the, the cracks in the wall, while they might be related to the earthquake, are not included in the insurance estimate. And so this extra painting is actually for all of our offices, but definitely for the cracks. So thank you for your, your question on thank that. Thank you for explaining about that crack. So we can go to the second insight. Oh, one th thing I wanted to tell you is the break room has been tentatively approved by the historic building commission and so with your support we will be able to move forward with this. Uh, the, this is for uh, inflationary and um, additional costs related to all of our contracts that we, uh, we execute for citywide services and also transparency. Next slide. Um, our, our final request is for a new FTE. Uh, we can One more go slide. to the next slide please. Um, I'll just keep talking while we go to the next slide. It's for a new FTE, which would be a special projects assistant who would sit in the recorder's office and would serve both the attorneys and the recorders and would be a technical expert to help with grandma, e-discovery, other technology, and would really support the city as a whole, especially with expanding grandma requests and would be focused also on both branches um, and any grandma or technology or records needs that the elected officials might have. So that's it for my budget presentation. You didn't see the last insight slide, but I can answer any questions. And then I also would love to give a brief introduction of the relationship between the district attorney's office and the city prosecutors. Council members, before we move over to prosecutors, any questions on those items? I feel like you should get water. Thanks. <laughs> uh, just maybe ice, too. I don't know what it is about uh, ice. You're asking but... for a lot now. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so before um, Sim and Ralph come up and, and Paul come up to, so, to present on the prosecutor's budget, I thought it would be helpful to give you an overview of the relationship between the district attorney's office and the city prosecutor's office. 
In 2015, and then again with some amendments in 2018, the city and the district attorney's office executed an agreement in which the city prosecutors, which are city employees, would be managed by the district attorney's office and the district attorney would be deputized as the city prosecutor to manage all of that, that those legal services. Those individuals remain as city employees, but they work in the district attorney's office and they're managed by the district attorney. The city pays a management fee, an operating fee, and a lease fee for these employees, and then they also we also pay them salary and benefits just like any other city employees. Um, as a final note, I know Sylvia mentioned, and you all have heard from Jen Bruno in unresolved issues, that there is additional discussion about the increased salary requests from the district attorney's office for the city prosecutors. And I want to just say at the outset that as the department director, even though I am not the city prosecutor and don't, don't manage that, that group um, specifically, I will always support and advocate for employees being paid at market value, and I wanted to be sure that the council knows that whatever you all decide in terms of that sal salary request, I will support. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Sim and team. Other questions as we transition? Okay. It's. Pride Festival, maybe. It's getting started. Do they have our PowerPoint? Did you have a I don't know. I make it up. But. <laughs> all right. Hi, Sam. Hi. How are you? First of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to come and share some thoughts with you. I want to thank first, before we begin, the mayor and uh, Katie as the city attorney for supporting uh, the proposal, some of the changes that we uh, are requesting and having their support is critical. Um, we're, our issues aren't very long, but just as a, a couple of things, as uh, Katie mentioned, that uh, uh, it's been a great, fruitful relationship with our office. Uh, it is something that uh, uh, we make no distinction between uh, city prosecutors and the district attorneys uh, in terms of office office, training. Uh, they're a great uh, partnership that uh, gives us both proximity and economies of scale uh, in terms of training and filing of charges. And uh, it's been a wonderful uh, partnership, something that we've uh, been very, very proud of. Um, so if we go to the first page on our presentation. Okay. So uh, currently, uh, as, uh, as uh, Katie uh, mentioned, Ms. Lewis mentioned that uh, we're uh, here as a part of an uh, interlocal agreement. Uh, from an attorney perspective, there's currently 16 uh, uh, prosecutors that are there. Uh, the uh, identified base amount uh, of $3 million, uh, $3.1 million uh, from, uh, without any additions. Um, one of the challenges that we have is that uh, we, and it breaks down to two uh, first as, uh, assistant city prosecutors, um, and three are current pending city uh, prosecutors, five associate city prosecutors, and that should actually be six open prosecutors because one attorney has been on military leave. Um, and so we've had a vacancy rate of approximately 31%. Currently, where we are is that we have altogether eight attorneys out of the 16 in our office. That's how depleted we are. And of those eight attorneys, two are on paternity leave. So we're actually down to uh, six line prosecutors. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about some of the conditions that have driven us to that uh, point. Um, the next slide, please. So what we, our priorities going into this year are just two fundamental things. One is salary parity within the prosecution community, and then the second, a FTE request for the Miami model prosecutor. And let me take just a couple of seconds to address both of them. Uh, coming out of COVID, uh, our uh, terrain for attorneys used to be fundamentally different than COVID happened. And subsequent to COVID, as we come out of it, 
this uh, paucity of prosecutors and uh, access to talented uh, legal talent has not only impacted uh, our community, Salt Lake City, Salt Lake County, it's impacted the state, it has impacted my colleagues from around the country. Um, I'm part of several organizations at the national level and the access to prosecution resources has been uh, impacting everyone, whether you go to Maricopa County, whether you go to Denver, whether you go to Florida, uh, that coming out of COVID impacted that. Now, a couple of things happened subsequent to that as well. Uh, if you look at some of the data for the last 12 years, there was actually a reduction in the number of admissions that were going into law school. So there was a number of people who were coming out of law school had been depleting. The post-COVID adjustment and certain industries that thrived uh, started to uh, address that paucity by basically from the top down, uh, uh, cannibalizing those assets, if you will. In the public sector, that impact has been felt profoundly as well. Currently, for example, um, uh, we, we are trying to find parity even at the DA's office. We're uh, almost 16 prosecutors now uh, at, the, at the DA's office, separate from the concerns that we have, for example, at the city. One of the other uh, responses from the market was that there has been a huge fluctuation. So people came back from COVID, some chose not to come back. Uh, different private sector markets started to absorb them, and we saw a salary marketplace uh, fluctuation that occurred here in the state of Utah. We were struggling with that at the DA's office to find that parity, and we've been working with our council on that. That parity issue and market fluctuation was, uh, it created a competitive uh, environment from county to county, from uh, municipality to municipality, uh, it being exasperated uh, in the, uh, until the last legislative session when the Attorney General's office all, all got almost a 34% salary adjustment that uh, was made. That again impacted the pre-existing market issue and compounded the matter uh, even worse. Uh, the urgency of that matter was so great that we actually went back to our council and they responded by adjusting the base salary. So what is that impact? That impact is, in the state of Utah right now, if you are coming out of law school, zero years of experience, the market entry point is $112,360 at the, at the AG's office. We have met that at the Salt Lake County office and the other counties have responded similarly to address market fluctuation. So that, what does that mean for us at the city prosecutor's office? That currently at the city prosecutor's office, entry is at $82,000. There's a $30,000 deficit in the entry uh, level at the, at the city prosecutor's office. So you can understand from a market analysis that if you are gonna get a job at somewhere else making $112,000 or $114,000 a year, and you're coming out of law school, you're not gonna to wanna to apply for work where you're gonna make $82,000. So that is, the, that is the market fluctuation that is uh, impacting all of our different offices across the board. And, uh, and with the paucity of the number of attorneys that we have, that exasperates the problem. So hence the request for salary adjustments that has been proposed by the mayor and uh, the city attorney's office, which we hope you will uh, look at uh, and uh, fund for us because if we do not fund that, I will not be able to staff those positions. Those attorneys who are there right now, we are pleading with them to remain there because they know that they can leave right now and go to the AG's office and make $30,000 more, if not uh, beyond that point. They know that if they leave the city prosecutor's office, we will certainly hire them at the DA's office at that salary level. So it becomes both an issue of fundamental fairness and our market competitiveness, but more fundamentally, our ability to actually staff, fully staff the people that we need and be competitive to be able to do our job as public prosecutors in, the, in behalf of Salt Lake City. So, so that's the first part of it. The second part, the Miami model prosecutor, uh, and that- You need to move to the next oh. slides. Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, I was just gonna mention- I think two slides forward, actually. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Okay, the Miami model uh, prosecutor is a request that we're making 
Um, some of my colleagues who were here probably from many years ago may remember uh, that at one time we had gotten a federal grant that helped us create a CAT team model, which was a community action team model. And what that allowed us to do is to take a prosecutor and embed them into our community to be granularly present for those issues, whether they are issues of homelessness or those issues which are of nuisance, those kind of issues. And it served really well. And when we went to Miami, one of the things that we have been trying to address is our homeless issue challenge that we have. And we've been in conversation with uh, both uh, Judge Landau and from uh, Legal Defenders. And one of the things that we've recognized is that we need a dedicated court calendar where all these individuals can be moved into. And then we have the continuity of both accountability and follow through with the kind of care that they need. But that needs a dedicated person for that dedicated caseload. So that is what the purpose of that particular ask is going to be. And, uh, and that's why we've requested that because we think it will actually help us address some of the issues that have been uh, being discussed more broadly and generically. So in essence, those are the, 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 the two fundamental requests that we have, but I'm more than happy and my colleagues and I are more than happy to answer any specific questions that you may have. Thanks, Tim. Council members, we've talked about this one request a little bit already in unresolved issues. Um, any other questions while we have Sam Gill here? Yes. Um, I'm going to ask your forgiveness because I'm a direct communicator and this budget has given me fits and more gray hairs than I care to cover on a regular basis. Never complain about a gray hair. Sorry. <laughs> Someone who will take any you got. Um, so I would like to talk about two things. Number one, the numbers were not provided to the administration in time. I'd like to know where the bottleneck was and why now we're having to make dimes do the work of dollars to get to pay parity, especially when it's always a consideration for this council and we're having to get blood from stones. And then the second thing is I'd like to know what we've done to the culture in your office. We've read many reports and have a lot of anecdotal evidence. And I say this to my police people, I say it to every other department. When I invest a dollar, I want to be sure my dollar is going to do that work. And we know that while pay parity is important, we know among the emerging generation in particular, a sense of mission, acceptance, being heard, being responded to, and having a job that fulfills them personally is nearly equally as important. We're being told all the time people don't leave jobs, they leave managers. What have we done to the culture in the department so that when we do raise pay as much as we can and get blood from these stones, that we are not going to continue to have a turnover rate that is this high? I'll, I'll address the first one. My name is Ralph Chamis. I'm Sims Chief Deputy. Um, the, the, the difficulty of this was that, like Sim said, when the legislature adopted the pay proposal, I frankly have been in government service for a long time and have never seen a pay increase of this size particularly for attorneys. So we knew the Attorney General had made the request. We were frankly stunned that the legislature actually approved it when they did. The next part of that that was even kind of more surprising was that they actually made it retroactive to April 1st. So those were two events that frankly none of us had seen, none of us could have anticipated. We did not actually get what the pay plan was and how they were gonna distribute the money to their individual attorneys until right at the end of March. So it was kind of too late for to get in the normal budget process. So we certainly wish that hadn't have happened. And we're certainly very appreciative of the mayor and the mayor's administration for even putting this on because it is such an, an emergent and kind of an unexpected way of handling with it. We first heard it, my first thought was, great, this will all happen July 1, you know, in the normal course when the state's fiscal budget, fiscal year runs. Uh, we were stunned that that included, you know, not only the cost of living, the 5% that the, the statewide employees got, but also this additional money. And we had to wait to see how it was actually distributed before we could even send it on to the city or our council to even have an idea. Because clearly you don't want to overshoot if they're paying, you know, like, if, if they could have put that money in a different way. They weighted their money um, heavily at the entry level and kind of the beginning of the career for, for individuals, which I think is smart given, like Sim said, the supply of lawyers has dramatically changed in the last 10 years where people are not going to law school. The number of lawyers has diminished. 
the number of, of, of people who do not have jobs coming off of law school is basically zero. So it's difficult as government to, to make those promises when we don't know staffing, we don't know salaries. There's a whole variety of reasons why that makes it harder for us to compete in the market. So the short answer is we certainly wish we weren't here. We certainly wish we weren't on the supplemental part. We wish we had known and had been able to provide that so that it could have been kind of the competition for every other budgetary item. Those are the facts of how it came about. So please know this was not, we, we didn't hold anything back. I, I, I joked the minute I, I found out the actual pay structure, I texted this to, you know, to, to Deb Alexander and to Katie Lewis, and I was on my 25th anniversary trip to Hawaii with my wife on the beach saying, oh my goodness, <laughs> we've just got this, what are we going to do? Um, so please, know that's, that's the short answer to the first part is we didn't really know until we got that information. And, um, and since then, we've been working really hard to try to figure out what are the things we can do, because I agree completely with the next part. I'll let Sim or Paul answer that. I can tell you people don't leave jobs because solely because of pay, but if you're a brand new lawyer coming out in this type of market and you recognize you can make twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more somewhere else, I have a difficult time believing that we can create those other things would make someone not think I will take those things as opposed to paying off my student loans for law school and or a market and a, you know, a house in this housing market as well. So I hope that explains the first part. Thank you. And I would just add to that, it was not only as these developments happened, which we were trying to monitor and anticipate, but the net effect of that was uh, existentially urgent. Uh, I also interact with the county council, and uh, one of the things that they don't want to, we have year-end budgets, one of the things that they never would like to do is to do a mid-year or pre-mid-year budget adjustment. Uh, as a result of this emergent existential issue, uh, they ended up uh, unanimously supporting, uh, in total, uh, uh, almost six million dollars, five point something nine million dollars adjustments. So we could uh, both we could make the adjustments, and LDA Legal Defenders could make adjustments as well. And that is unprecedented. But they saw that not doing so would create such a structural deficit that the institution could not survive. I think that's my frustration, yeah. is that this is a high priority, yeah. as is everything else, and our constituents are already going to pay more for water this year. They are going to pay more for their sanitation this year. We are bleeding people dry, and so it is frustrating to have to go back and try to find a couple hundred thousand here and there when it feels like we have a gun to our head because this is a necessary service. Absolutely, Com uh, completely. So as to the second qu uh, question about, if I understand it, in terms of quality of life and culture in the office, um, I am very proud of our culture, and we have taken a multi-pronged approach to address that issue. And, uh, and you don't have to just take my word for it. We worked in a collaborative partnership with the Yale Law School. Actually, we petitioned to have them come, uh, uh, and we were selected out of a national search uh, with the Yale Law School. Uh, and they came in for 18 months into our office, and we were trying to, it was critical to us not only to go out and do our objective work, but also if we do not have the internal culture that coincides coincides with the idea of justice and fairness, and how do we internalize those procedurally and operationally. And that's, that was their 18 months of work that they did, because it was important for us not for only the attorneys who were there, but how do we cultivate and nurture that for the next generation of attorneys who come in there. And the work that they've done and the work that our leadership has done in partnership with that continues to evolve and change our culture. The other part of that is that uh, internally, uh, from, our, from a professional development perspective, uh, we at the Salt Lake County DA's office, because of our training facility, we provide more opportunities for professional development uh, in-house than almost any other organization in the state of Utah. We will probably do in excess of 30 to between 30 to 40 CLEs in-house. Uh, so that has been a huge boon for people in terms of wanting to stay and have that be developed. 
The other thing that we've done where the city gets the benefit as we, and it's selfish for me because I get the benefit of it at the D, as the Salt Lake County DA as well, and I take both uh, uh, responsibilities very seriously. Um, we made about three years ago a very conscious, deliberate decision to change the model of how attorneys come into our organization, how they're acculturated into our organization. So we do, it's a four year investment. We start with 1L, 2L, 3L lawyers in there, and then post uh, graduation. And we have started to build that relationship of investment of time into, into their professional development with an eye towards that they will be hired by the Salt Lake City Prosecutor's Office as on that, on that, and then we expect them to work a year to two years at the city prosecutor's office before they can eventually be moved into the district attorney's office. So that's the model that we've created. So has that model given us any benefit? Yes, I, as I'm sitting here today, as of right now, I have 29 interns, 29 uh, attorney, uh, future attorneys who are in our office at different level of professional development. So that is helping us change the culture. The other thing that we've tried to do is we've tried to balance life-work balance. One of the advantages that we have with this partnership, as well as for all the attorneys there, we have an on-site, on in-house uh, daycare center, which is unheard of. Uh, because we know that this young attorneys who are coming are starting families that makes a difference. We have an on-site fitness facility. Uh, we uh, do what we call open mic nights because we're bringing families in once in a, once every two or two months where people perform and we bring and welcome all the families of our people, support staff, our attorneys, because we want to have that work-life balance. We on-site uh, have classes about yoga and meditation uh, to give different experiences to all our folks. And then within the diversity of the work that we do uh, in terms of uh, uh, cutting edge stuff that we're doing, which is for this next generation very important, we were the first office that created a, a conviction integrity unit in our office, which is very important to people in terms of justice and fairness. Uh, the pre-filing diversion programs and the alternatives to prosecution models uh, that we have has been a huge boon uh, for, the, for this next generation that is completely invested in the idea of justice and fairness. And so all of these different things that we're doing are uh, continuing to evolve and create a very rich and diverse culture um, that people want to be a part of. Do we do any feedback gathering on those initiatives to make sure that they're meaningful? They all sound wonderful to me. Oh. I have never been an attorney, yeah. so I'm very outside looking in. Uh, have, do we do any feedback gathering to make sure that we're investing our time and energies and things that are significant to the people who work there? Yeah, go ahead. To answer that question, informally we do. Um, we, we haven't done any recent um, anonymous surveys, which are a good idea, and we, we probably will be doing those soon. But informally, we definitely seek feedback. Um, sorry, Paul Fuller, I'm the division administrator um, responsible for, I work with Scott and Paige in managing the city is one of my responsibilities. I want to add to two things that Sim said because I think it also answers your um, first question towards culture, environment, and feeling fulfilled. There's a couple structural things that we've done this year too that I think has had a great effect on the city. Um, the city used to be on our second floor and kind of apart from um, the rest of the county uh, district attorneys. Um, we intentionally changed that this year. We moved them up to the first floor, fourth floor. They're now co-located with our major crimes unit, which is another responsibility of mine. These are felony attorneys that, that do everything outside of our specialty teams. We did that intentionally so that they're on the same floor and working closely together on projects and cases, sometimes being able to um, crosstalk and stuff like that. That has had a positive effect and I think directly affects what, what your, your concern is. Um, in addition to that, one other thing that we've done structurally is we've changed the way we prosecute a little bit. We have a little bit more of a vertical prosecution within the office now where the prosecutors are assigned to judges instead of um, maybe being a more random assignments week to week, month to month. And that is allowing them to stick with their cases and their victims. Um, I think it's serving not only them and their happiness and fulfillment in their job, but also the, the community well. So I wanted to give a couple more examples. Can I jump in on just one of the things too? The um, if you haven't been to our building, 
we would love to show you the building. I think I think Katie mentioned that the, the inner local was renegotiated. That that was coincided with when we moved into the new building. Um, the city again, the city prosecutors. Unless you knew they were city prosecutors, you would not know they were different than employees of of the district attorney's office. All of our offices are the same. All the amenities are the same. The, like Paul said, we make and, and Sim said the training is the same. We make all you know, the every the computers. No difference between them, except for right now the you know the pay and benefits are, are controlled by the city council. Um, but I would encourage you. We'd love to have you come because it's a great building. Yeah, it's a great building. We're we're proud of it. Uh, Sim designed it with some real real policy decisions on transparency. Um, if you come in, you'll notice that at the front of every office is clear glass. We don't, you know, because if the taxpayers are paying us to work, they ought to be able to walk by and see what we're working. Um, but we'd love to give you a tour, love to show you the daycare. The, the city does, because it's a county benefit in our local, we did agree that the city employees will have the same amenity. The city does subsidize that for anyone who actually participates in that benefit. Um, but it's a great, it's, that's the best part of my day is when all those kids walk around, you know, they bring them for a walk around the office. Yeah, that. That's the best part of the day. So just, okay. we'd love to have you come see anytime. Yeah, thank you, you like for to. the invitation. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to clarify the numbers and maybe Jennifer Bruno can help us or Sylvia. I'm seeing in this list 322. I'm also seeing a figure of 340 and a number of 214. Are these clarified figures and what do each mean? And, and, all of those are in addition to the already proposed $200,000 increase, is that correct? Okay, so they are, um, I think they are all in addition to the proposed budget, which includes $200,000. Um, they are not in the proposed budget yet, so any number that's added would be the council's decision. Mm -hmm. The 340 the would be to fully fund them to the market adjustments, which would match the, the county district attorney's office attorneys as well as the attorney general's office. What is the 322,000 number? So I think the difference between the 322,000 and the 340,000 is two employees that were not originally included in that salary adjustment. Okay, so 340 is the correct number. I think 340 is... I, I don't think that included the first two first assistants. The 340 is the correct number, the okay. full number. Full of and then the 214 is if we were to raise them to 95% of the market, but not quite 100%. But it doesn't include those two employees, is so what I'm worried about. Two, so I think that. 225 we'll, or so. Well, yeah, we would have to do more work okay. to figure that out. I, I guessed. I'm sorry, I'm not a numbers guy, but I, was, I thought it was 322 on top of the 200. The original numbers that were run, I know that I saw some by uh, David Salazar. It was around 540 to get us to that thing. So I think it's 322 on top of the 200. Right, which is, yeah, that, yeah that's what we said. Sorry. That's Sorry. what we said in the beginning, yeah. yeah. The 200 is in addition to the 322. Yeah. But the difference is that, that, that there's a 322 figure and a 340 figure, okay. and that is two employees that weren't originally factored yeah. in. Yeah. That need to be factored in, or are they a different class of employees? I think, factored yeah, I think we're coming in. to the understanding that they probably should be factored in and probably, yeah. So 322 is just no longer it that's an old number 340 is the updated number what do we need to do to make sure that we're dealing with the right numbers if we're still adding employees at this late date i'm really nervous we need to be well past the we have two more people point in this there they were um i think included originally and then we've had several machinations so i don't know where the mistake was made but we're pretty confident, aren't we, Jennifer, about the three? We're exceeding the 90% threshold of certainty here. I, I, I can't say that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, well, it's the best guess we have. Yeah, it's better than zero. <laughs> and we have to realize this is for 16 or 18 FTEs, and right now we have, we're staffed at eight with two on uh, paternal leave. So, so uh, it, they're not going to get there in this first year unless a miracle happens that we can hire up to 16 more or eight more attorneys in the next uh, yeah. two to four months. There would likely well, be some vacancies. And the bar comes out this some. So the question I have is on, on that whole staffing side of the house is, I mean, this should have a serious impact on our case turn rate and our 
uh, in our ability to actually prosecute and uh, go to court. Yeah. Uh, yes, you're right. And, and I think you're making a, a very uh, astute observation. This allows the bleeding to stop and puts us in the best position to hire in a competitive market without losing those assets that we have already put in the queue. But if we don't address this issue, we are going to lose even the limited assets that we have because why would anybody financially stay when they can walk across uh, the, the town and pick up $30,000 more? Okay. Alejandro? Thank you, uh, Sam, for you. being here, Ralph, and, and I forgot your name. Uh -huh. uh, thank you, Paul. I, uh, so, obviously, it's, a, it's, a, it's, uh, it's about money. Uh, ultimately, it is about finding the resources. But, you know, we've been talking about this uh, for weeks now uh, to try to make sure that we find parity, not only between the attorneys within your office, but with the LDA. And as you probably know, it is very important to us to make sure that we we raise those two uh, equally, or at least that's the, that's the question we have, or, or trying to answer that uh, as far as money. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that you knew that from us directly, or at least from me directly, that's what I stand. Uh, obviously, if we have an unlimited amount of money, ideally we match everything to the county level, which is the state level, and everybody is happy, uh, but it seems like the reality is not there right now as far as uh, resources. But uh, it is my commitment uh, to to your uh, attorneys uh, uh, to to do a, a, whatever I can to raise that, but also uh, to make sure that the LDA attorneys are matched to the same level, um, uh, and that is something that I, I feel very strongly about. As you probably know, I did work for the LDA back in the day. Um, so, uh, thank you for being here. I just wanted to give you that piece so can of information. I, can I, I, mean, I, I, I hope that no one ever thinks that we would do nothing but fully support LDA attorneys because the the system works only works if both the defendant and the state have adequate resources. So our office has done nothing but believe that LDA needs their, has the resource need. I would also, just one other caveat to that is, I don't want people to just automatically think you have to double this number to get to LDA, because in justice court, obviously while the city prosecutors handle every prosecution, LDA does not handle every defense. There are private attorneys who take that as well. So there's a, 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 a cutback on that, so it's not exactly double. Just to make sure everybody okay. keeps that in the back of their mind. All right. I think we, we're probably going to bring this back up again in the next item, which is unresolved issues when we talk about the whole, all of the things that are not yet in the budget and may need to be. Um, are there any other questions, though, about what this means first? Councilmember Warden. Yeah, sorry. I was trying to look at the sheet here, but um, did you already say what, what you would do if we were only able to do 95% at market? It's not a question of what I would do. The question is, what would the attorneys who are there who are going to be able to go somewhere else? So it does put us at a disadvantage. I think we just need my job is to come and share with you what the reality is. And uh, and so uh, right now we've had those attorneys. We have asked them to stay there because we said, hey, we don't know what the council is doing. It's the process is going forward. And uh, and then. So I do worry about the ability to staff uh, those positions, and that's my concern. That's what I'm sharing with you. And what's with the unfilled positions that you have right now, um, how have you been addressing that? So the way we're trying to do is that, um, of course, obviously, uh, the salary, truing up the salary was critical. Uh, so now we are competitive. The second part of it is to fill those positions this is why we invested that, made that four-year model. I, for the first time, I've never had as many interns and as many people interested in coming to to be work, working at the, DA, at the city prosecutor's office and at the DA's office. So I, we are doing everything we can, both in terms of going outside and recruiting, uh, as well as uh, the, the making the long-term investment in from 1Ls all the way up to post 4L. Now, I'll share one story with you. For example, 
we had a person uh, uh, who were very supportive of. He is getting ready to take his bar exam. We've kept him hired uh, as a clerk while he's getting ready to take his bar exam. He's from Las Vegas. He brings a level of uh, wide experience and diversity. Uh, and after having made these multiple year investments, um, he's thinking about going to the, D, uh, to the Attorney General's office. And I can't honestly stop him because he's gonna make $30,000 more. And, but he was in line to be hired at the city prosecutor's office. So are there other people who we had cultivated to be hired at the city prosecutor's office who are not going to apply at the city prosecutor's office? Yes. That's just the reality that we have to acknowledge. Uh, so that's where we find ourselves. And our, our hope Appreciate is that because of the increase in number of, of law clerks and interns that we've had, that we have kind of been making them conditional. You know, we can't make them an offer until they actually remember the bar and are qualified through the city process. But we've told them, assuming you pass the bar, assuming you go through the process, we will, we will have you a position at the city attorney's office. And last year we got... We, we had our eight. So we, I mean, we are bringing, that's one of the things that the county is committing to, to try to bring them in to the city prosecutor's office by bringing them early, letting them have the experience, let them understand the culture of the office, let them understand, you know, the, the advantages of working at the city and then potentially working for our office. But again, I, I don't know how we do that if someone's, again, and please remember, we're, we are only talking about being competitive with the attorney general's office and our office. We're not even remotely talking about what the private sector is paying now and what the market has done to the private sector, which is blows all of this remotely. We'll our, engineers this all, will, okay. our engineers will. Yeah, if, if we remotely came close to the private idea. sector, we would be we would all have a very different uh, a different number. Uh, sorry, just Go ahead. what I'm trying to get at is that we added. Uh, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before, but we added either one or two prosecutors, um, and but. If you've been able to work through having as many vacancies as you have, um, you know, is it possible that we increase for, um, you know, to fill, but we don't fill all the vacancies? Can you continue to carry that? You've been carrying that workload. Yeah, well, that, I think that's being very. I know that's not ideal. Yeah, I don't yes, want that no, either. I, I, yeah. But I, I no, can't no. make the money appear. No, I no, I, I, I completely get it. And I think, I think, uh, uh, what everybody is sharing here is the difficulty of where we are. And I completely appreciate the position that you find yourself in. The goal here is to have a very open, honest, transparent conversation so we all own the decisions that we make. And that is the reality. And sometimes you have to make some hard decisions and then the best decisions that are available to, uh, to all of us, uh, myself included and yourself included in that. Um, and think, so I'm sharing with you what we I would I think that need. was an yeah. important question, though, yeah. um, what the council member Wharton, and, and I think it's, we understand that there's a competition in the market, and, and if you can make a certain amount more, you're going to choose that over the city prosecutor's office. But the question is, if we're not able to find the, all of the money to do that, and we can, let's say, for instance, we could go to 95% of the market for all of your 16 positions, or we could go to 100% of the market but only do 14 positions. Which would be preferred? So, so what that's you a, just said. okay. That, okay. The second so, one. Yeah, the second, we, yeah we, because we I think I think that I as long as as long as there is a commitment to say that I, I hope that I find myself where all those positions are filled. And then I can come to you and say, hey, I got two more positions I need to fill, but I can't fill them because I need an extra $40,000 or whatever. I would love to be in that position. So to answer your question, I need parity to actually be able to fill the position. So I would prefer the 14. And if, and if you say, look, Sim, we need to get through the next six months or next two, nine months or whatever, so we'll leave the door open when, when you need to come back, if you need to fill those, whatever, then okay. that's, I think that's a, that's, a good, that's a good solution. Because then the ones that I'm hiring, I'm hiring at, a, at the competitive level, and I need that. If I don't have that, I can't even fill the... Right. The 10 position. So. Right. Yeah. Thank you. That's I think that's exactly. Thank you for clarifying. And, and yes. that's, 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 can, I, can I make one point? Because I, I, I think you hit on a very important point. I mean, like Sim said, we currently have, you know, eight prosecutors and we have two on, out on, on maternity leave. Um, uh, and 
you know, we have six people doing the work of what should be 14. And it's kind of back to the point you, you made is at some point you don't have work-life balance. You're so overworked. You're so overwhelmed. It may not matter how much money you give yeah. you give them if they recognize that they're incapable of actually doing the work. And so we're trying to say at least we can it, it would be a huge morale morale boost to at least say this is what's happening. We're going to continue to work and continue to vigorously recruit, continue to vigorously develop people to come in and help with that workload because it's just it's, at some point it's not sustainable. And that's the difficulty okay. for these brand new lawyers that are overwhelmed. I think that gives us the information we need to, to deliberate yeah, thank this. You. Uh, th thank you for answering that question. Thank you. Um, any last thoughts or seeing no, none? Okay. okay. Thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you Absolutely. for helping us work through that. those questions. We're going to go to a break. Let's take 20 minutes. It is 3.20, so we'll come back at 3.40. Break. Damn, we're a minute early. We're a minute early. <laughs> this is like this is like platinum diamond stars ah, we get on yeah. our forehead. Wait, Dan, what was your rank when you retired? <coughs> okay, we I think we should when you remind me of the time, I'll be like, yes, commander. <laughs> yes, commander. <laughs> okay. So we have a, a very large list of unresolved issues. I think what we'd like to, what I'd like to do is have Jennifer go through the housing related items because it sounds like those may be able to be funded outside of the general fund. Mm -hmm. um, we're still waiting on final in, um, new growth numbers and some other numbers as well, or that's really the one we're waiting. That's on. really the main one. So that could drastically change what what we are able to and not able to fund. So let's start with the ones that we don't have to wait for those numbers on, which is housing. Is that Great. all right yep. with everyone? Okay. And I sent Thanks, this Jennifer. an email to you guys um, yesterday, last night, last night. Um, but I'll just kind of go over just the basics. So all of this, I'll just preface this by saying all of this is possible because of um, the administration's willingness to engage with both community neighborhoods and RDA to think about ways to proactively fund these items. Um, it's unusual and not required for the administration to do that, and it's been very helpful, and I think it's a mutual beneficial thing because I think those are projects that are in line with their goals, and then they have proposals for other funds that you know, they didn't want to necessarily upset, and so this is a way to think strategically about how all of the proposals can be funded. <clears throat> the, the kind of root of the ability to fund all of these is thinking about which funds were flexible and which funds had more strings. And kind of starting from that point, figuring out which items needed those flexible funds. So like which ideas fit neatly into one of the categories that had a bunch of strings and which of the um, projects did not fit neatly into categories that had a lot of strings. And the conclusion they came to is that the funding that had been proposed in the mayor's budget for the NOFA, the Notice of Funding Availability, that sort of general once a year call for ideas, um, was actually the most flexible funding because ultimately it was funded with general fund dollars. Now the council and the mayor wouldn't want to just not fund the NOFA. So then the next question became how, can, how else can the NOFA be funded? And what CAN realized is that there were quite a bit of dollars in their dormant HUD funds. These are those funds that we talked about last budget year that were sitting in accounts. And they have a few million in those accounts that actually have to be spent. So sort of like a time clock on them. HUD is requiring us to spend them by, I think it's the next calendar year, on housing development. And so what um, the administration realized is that it would actually be advantageous to use those funds for the NOFA instead of the general fund dollars, just for this one fiscal year, so that we could comply with HUD's requirement that we spend those monies on housing development. And then also it frees up the flexible dollars that were originally proposed in the mayor's budget to go to the NOFA. And that's about three million that we can supplant. It was about four point seven million. Four point seven. Yeah, and so and and I wouldn't use the word supplant necessarily, okay, but sorry, yeah. um, you know, just I think aligning dollars with I'm with, sure that with was... allowable uses. <laughs> so I think re recategorize. Recategorize. Yeah. Let's let's use that one. Yeah. Recategorize. So with that in mind, um, I uh, maybe I'll start with um, the 
uh, council proposal that actually did fit well with some of the dormant HUD funds was the loan program for naturally occurring affordable housing. So what, um, and the chart in the staff report says recommended funding source, but it really should just say like staff level recommendation. Obviously this is subject to your guys's um, uh, t discussion, but um, I think to your point earlier, this is all, these are all non-general fund dollars. These are all fund, funds that are elsewhere. Go ahead. Can you remind me of how much of those dormant funds we're talking about? So there's about 12 million in the current budget and um, it has grown because they're earning interest on some of the programs to about 14 million. Quite a few of those funds have uh, very long strings. Um, they relate to federal tracking and reporting and things like that. Um, the administration is transmitting, I think they're planning on transmitting today, a proposal with how to spend all of that money and this is included in that. So I think they appreciated having your guys' list of what you um, hoped and desired <laughs> for housing because it allowed them to kind of take stock of what could fit in those dormant when, HUD when funds. When you say this, is you're talking about 23 or you're talking about several, several of these so, projects? So the council actually uh, recognized the money in the fiscal year 23 budget. So it's sitting there as unallocated money. But the reason it's unallocated is because of all the strings and requirements that are needed to actually get the money released. So um, the proposal is to uh, budget include this loan program for naturally occurring affordable housing in the fiscal year 24 budget because there is money sitting there that are that is eligible to be used for this project. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to come from the 24 but the general fund right. because it's coming from the money that we recognized last year right from HUD. Yes. So in your sort of tracking sheet you could say that it's checked off, right? Like the, it's funded, but it's not funded with your general fund balancing number, right? That number Actually that we from always affordable housing, and that's one million dollars as sort of a initial amount, right? right. Um, I I think that's a, I, I would like to support that. Okay. Yeah, I, I would like to support as well. I think it's a big deal. Uh, I Why appreciate Councilmember Valdemar bringing this up. I, I I do have a concern about this is a new program. Um, how we're going to implement a new program. Not, again, not that this is a good idea, this is a great idea, but uh, the, since the money is, uh, it has deadlines, uh, my question is could it be the money be used maybe on some other of these ideas and something that we can implement faster? So this, um, this section of the dormant HUD funds does not have those funding deadlines. So, Fantastic. and so within the proposal, and we just got a message from CAN that they did send that transmittal over today. So the, the section of funds that they, that do have deadlines are proposed to be transferred to the RDA for the NOFA. And so they will get spent within the year. Um, and that's why the NOFA is a good option for those funds because it gets the funds out right away. That sounds, that answers the question. Thank you. But I, I want to kind of piggyback on the question because it does take staff to, and a program you got to like, What's this, what's what's the repair limit? How do we choose programs? And does RDA, whoever is going to administer, can is going to administer can, this one, right? Does can have this current staff to administer this program? Uh, and can, I would say probably the the next one. Well, I think no, no we mind. can follow up with staff on that. Um, we can, and Jen, we can follow ahead. up. But, sorry, but when I met with the mayor and staff, they said that this was one of the ones that they could easily implement because they already do the home, so I get this, sorry, I understood it right, they already do home repair uh, similar to this, so they're going to mimic that. But this, uh, the difference between just a home repair is that now there is a, a hook. So yeah, we'll loan you the money as long as you keep it affordable for 15 years or whatever it is the loan okay. uh, length and also that we get first right of refusal if at some point they want to sell before this is paid off or at the time it's paid off then the city picks that or get, has a chance to pick up that property for our community land trust and what we would typically do uh, with a new trust what we would typically do with a new program is ask the administration to come back with the details once they've figured out all those details. Right. And so we could just clarify that in the adoption documents that, you know, you're allocating this money with this policy goal and the administration will return with a proposal. Thank you. Thanks. Anna, 
Are we convinced that one million is the right number for a pilot program? I'm convinced. I mean, I, I said, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking if we can do fifty thousand dollars. Oh, I don't, I'm not going to tell the administration exactly what. But well, what you mean. envision when you propose this yeah, is yeah. Envision is that, fifty thousand dollar repairs on average for houses? Yeah, maybe for a roof, and maybe here the architect can <laughs> can tell I, us how what those costs are. But I'm not sure a fifty thousand dollar loan, maybe a zero interest loan oh, for fifty thousand yeah. dollars, would be zero. enough of a carrot. Um, but with everyone in with the asset. Uh, Appraised values having gone up so high, everyone has access to so much potential home equity line of credit that I'm I'm not sure that I'm not sure that it would or would not Are we, result in people saying, "Yeah, I'd rather take this fifty thousand dollars because it has a lower interest rate and agree to put caps on my deed restrictions on my property." I, I don't know if that's a big enough carrot, but I think a million dollars is a good amount of money to put in the budget to ask CAN staff to figure out what the size of the carrot needs to be. Also then, are we considering alternative credit ratings? Are we are we attempting to target the people who yes. might not qualify for traditional home equity loans because of traditional credit scores or things like this? Oh, I'm not. I don't have those details, but for sure it wasn't my intention for somebody that could acquire or, or has, you know, an, an income right. level this high. But I'm thinking, if I look at my district, I know a lot of older folks that maybe are in fixed incomes could potentially use that money to fix their home and, um, you know, and, and, um, and maybe they rent part of it or whatever and stay there. Or you know, or be able to to function as a homelessness prevention element. Keep the people who are most at risk of losing homes probably have credit impaired by medical bills that are outstanding, things that are keeping a traditional credit score low. But you know, um, I know there's a lot of work being done right now in the private sector, both at Sorensen Impact Center, at Swazo, at a whole bunch of different things that look at how do we maintain some sense of credit worthiness, a, a realistic expectation that we can recuperate funds without relying on a traditional, you know, Experian credit score. I think, I think, I think we're, we're giving, getting a little into the too weeds. far into the weeds. I think the point is what level do we want to fund the program at? I just want to make sure a million later. is the right Ms. number. Ms. Mr. Chair, I think that Jennifer just sent a text uh, they can and the transmittal. Uh, recommends $1.2 million for this program. I, I'm okay supporting that to that level um, uh, from that. And then, then, and then we can... Uh, and we can come back and get into yes. those details. The details, too. Yeah. Thank you. But the point is supporting people that are housed but need help with the repairs. Mm -hmm. I, or I think or property owners that are renting at an affordable yes. level. At affordable meaning... You know, not deeply affordable, but also not yeah. market rate. Like, because maybe it's an older home or whatever, um, and needs repairs, and that's why it's cheaper. Think, right? That's not. I'm sense. seeing pr pretty general support of the yeah, idea. Yeah. Okay. So let's go on to the next one, which is ADU incentives. So I'm actually going to switch to this chart. Oh, okay. Um, and it's not. I don't have it printed out, but this is what I sent around, and I can um, forward it to the recorder's office. So <laughs> sorry about that. Um, this is just showing how um, the pot of money of flexible dollars, uh, which was originally funded in the no for the NOFA in the mayor's recommended budget, is funding a grouping of projects that, for one reason or another, need a little bit more flexibility in the funding source. And I can talk through each one and why it needs a little bit more flexibility in the funding source. Um, so, But you'll see that the total amount that was originally recommended in the mayor's budget for the NOFA was just over four point, well, just under 4.3 million. And the total amount um, for uses doesn't quite add up to that. And so maybe the council's discussion could, you know, balance that out, like maybe increasing funding here or there. Anyway, the first item is the NeighborWorks Partnership. And originally, um, the discussion was to fund this from the Westside Community Initiative. There are challenges with, with that based on the mix of income um, AMI targets in the end product of the project. And the Westside Community Initiative, because it's funded through the Inland Port, has a statutory requirement that it be 80% or below AMI. And that's a statutory requirement. So. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. I think I should. So we already know what Never 
never works once, the different incomes that never works yes. once to work. Yes, and that. I think their idea is a mix, and it would be a third 80% AMI or below, a third 80 to 120, and a third market rate. And, I, and to their credit, the administration thought, well, could you fund a third of it yeah. with this or, or not? And you could, but ultimately that felt more complicated than you needed to be, especially when you had flexible dollars otherwise. I, I, it seems complicated, and I know I hate uh, adding complications, but I feel like it, I would like to at least tap on the, some of that money uh, and, and, and actually get a, a, a known provider, uh, a known uh, entity, uh, not only on the west side, but in the city as a whole. So if we can actually hybridize this funding uh, from some of these uh, more flexible dollars, but also from the, I, I just want to have one good example from that west side uh, money that we're saving. And You're just saying just have it, it's important to you to use west side community initiative funding for a project that you can stand behind and believe in, and this yeah, and is hopefully, one. and hopefully, you know, so seven hundred thousand essentially for the third that qualifies from the West Side Community Initiative, and then the remaining fourteen. 1.4 million from these flexible funds. Uh, and, and, and me, I'm saying this just because of, from a, you know, a standpoint that I, I'm coming from and trying to make a case about this. But again, if it's too complex and too, too, I mean, too, I think I think I prefer to do that. But I, I leave it up to uh, you. We can follow up with RDA staff to see if that makes sense. I think that this is one of the projects that because. Um, RDA staff and can have not been engaged with um, the partner with NeighborWorks on a uh, spreadsheet level. Um, they still needed to engage with NeighborWorks on a term sheet, kind of the standard, you know, discussions with the city. And so maybe um, that's part of their future discussions. But I think that um, we could we could work with the RDA to put like a placeholder in both areas, both the West Side Community Initiative and the Housing Development Program, to fund that. Okay. Um, all right. And the next item, um, sorry, just noting that. The next item is the citywide ADU incentive program. And the reason that um, after further looking, the uh, administration was thinking that those needed more flexible dollars is because we don't know where or what AMI the um, person who is building the ADU might be, nor do we know what their AMI might change to once they have an ADU and might be using it for an income generating yeah. property, right? And so rather than having to um, kind of torture the homeowner with all those hoops, uh, with these flexible dollars, it can be whatever program you want it to be. Um, so that's a million there. I like that. Then um, gap financing for sw the switch point project. Um, again, not knowing whether it's an uh, uh, so we knew a little bit. We know a little bit more now, which is that it's not building housing units, but it's expanding services to support that housing. Um, and these flexible dollars don't have any requirements about housing units must be built. Um, and then the next item is the sanctioned camping grant that I think we've discussed before, and I think the same um, reasoning applies of why flexible dollars make sense to use here. I actually would propose that we invert these and do 250 to switch point since it's not for the structure, it's for program. I'm, I'm happy contributing to it, but I'd rather see 500 in for the program that we were describing on the meeting with the administration. And if we... Uh, program that you're describing, the sanctioned camping? So, yeah, so would you like to describe it a little bit for the people who didn't get to be in our meeting yesterday? I really love this concept. I, I, I mean, unfortunately, I, I remember I dropped halfway through. I couldn't connect back again to, to, this, to the call, um, so I'm not <laughs> completely sure I'm caught up on the final uh, thought on this. Maybe Cindy... It's just, it's just. I think um, if you just describe your proposal. Oh, my proposal. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So the the general uh, idea behind this is to uh, create some sort of uh, grant mechanism within the city for providers. Uh, you know, whatever size of provider you are, uh, uh, to be able to uh, access some of this money, all of it or some of it, to uh, start a sanction campaign. Uh, in or out the city 
and those details, I guess, we are we're willing to, uh, you know, we uh, are for to discuss. But um, hopefully, the grant is a match grant. So if you are asking us for twenty thousand dollars, you are able to get twenty thousand dollars from the county or the state uh, to match those 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 monies to be able to to start. Uh, this process, um, and I just want to make sure that there is not that many barriers as far as funding to create this other resource for those that are unsheltered, um, and uh, I think it is the right way to go. Again, we don't take ownership on this issue as far as, you know, we are not running the camp. We are not in charge of responsible uh, for it, its success. Obviously, we want it to succeed, um, but we are just putting some, setting some money aside that it could be access, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping the administration will come up with our, maybe our, our input about a mechanism and some uh, ties to how you access this money. So you're, you're hope, and you're hoping for the private sector to step up through this. So maybe a church willing to set aside a corner of their property to put ten campers on asking the city for some money, asking another entity, private or public, for money that matches it Correct. to then help slowly but surely get some people into places with safety. My only caveat would be anyone who gets it, I would, even though we're not responsible for it, I would like us to have a code of certain things that we expect them to abide by. We did have a tragedy when someone tried to do this out of best intentions. And so making sure, like, you know, there's some basic information about safety and you know, things that we expect to protect human life. But I love this activation of letting people in small ways do their part to try to start helping. We're going to have to deal with land use issues, though, Yeah. Well. And, right. I mean, I'll that's stand, not... I'll stand in that headwind for us. I'm fine with that. Churches might be... Churches would be exempt, be, I would have yeah. thought. The, and Denver, uh, and again, I always go back to Denver because this is one of the, f the places that I visited the most, but I also see this in Seattle um, when I visited the, some of their camps in there. But in Denver, uh, they started in churches. Um, and uh, they rotated them, and churches, you know, signed up for this, and they said, okay, we're going to have 10 tents, and they did it through COVID, uh, and they started some tents in their, in, their, uh, in their parking lots, and it was their decision to do, and they ran it, and they were successful. It was almost like the pilot program of the safe outdoor spaces that I, uh, we visited with Councilmember Fowler and Valdemoros last time, and uh, before with Councilmember uh, Petro. Okay, I mean, I think this falls a little bit into the same category as put some money in and figure out exactly the details yeah. later. I'm not opposed to switching switch point down to 250 and sanction camping up to 500 if other council members agree to that. I'm okay with switching it, but this is one of those, uh, the devil is in the details on this stuff. And right now we're looking at a pilot program working with the state and the state funding a lot of things and putting a lot of... Uh, 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 guardrails into the program just like we did the guardrails when we did the Ramada last year the year before so we need to be very cautious on this because we could this could actually uh, get derailed and we could have some a lot of issues with the smaller campgrounds and throughout the city that we actually have now so I would I want to make sure that we study with this and I'm getting into details so I mean I think it's I, I agree with you, Councilman Dugan. I think it's we're putting five hundred thousand dollars towards the belief that there's something there yeah, in this so, model that is better than what we I have. Mean, and I, I'm, I'm okay with having RVs, the money there. If they want to take a couple RVs off the street, that would help our district tremendously. The, ba the tension we're balancing is that we are already at late summer levels with issues right. in our district, and we have we're not even zeroing in on the property yet for the state solution. We need to we need to incentivize the private sector to do what they do. Okay. Um, so, yes, we we need to be cautious on this one, but I understand. I um, yeah, I'm not. Uh, what I've seen from I, I didn't get a chance to go to the Denver um, trip, and I haven't seen, um, but I did see the pictures there, and I admit it was impressive. It was um, made me more want to hear more about it, but. I still have reservations that I brought up with you. I don't know if we've talked about them yet. Um, but before I'm ready to vote for this, um, even at the the amount that's being proposed, um, I really need to know more. 
And so those of you that feel really strongly that, that putting this aside is going to make a difference, I hope we can set aside time to talk because I'm not there yet. I appreciate I, that, Councilmember Wharton. I agree, and I, I hope that you know we definitely have more to catch up. But I'm, maybe we hope I'm hoping that with this money we we do the same that we did with with that other program that we are funding uh, that 1.2 million dollars is that we ask the administration to come up with you know maybe some guardrails to protect you know our stance with the state, the county, but also uh, you know with those residents within the camps and with the community and how it all fits. So but I'm, I'm hearing hoping from- that we. But we can pun that question, but we should definitely talk. What about I heard it. from Councilman Wharton, though, is that it sounds like you're more comfortable with the 1.2 for naturally occurring with figuring out the guardrails later and less comfortable with this one before budget. Is that is that what you were saying? Okay. Um, and Councilman Dugan's the same? Yes, or like a, another potential scenario that, you know, we could talk through. I'm open to hearing, like, a number of different things, but I, I, I need to be... Uh, I need you to help me, like, and catch I, the magic. And I'm probably um, somewhere in the middle okay. uh, from where Petro and Pui are and uh, okay. Dugan and Wharton. I, 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 th- I feel pretty comfortable with it, but I would love that additional information. But it sounds like we have a couple council members asking maybe those conversations can happen would offline. It, would it be helpful for you guys to get on an airplane, $100 round trip to Denver, go check it, and then come back? Like, see it for yourselves, because it did help me. And, and we leveraged with another tra- a traveling trip that we had. Like, we weren't, that wasn't in our agenda, but we decided, I decided to go to actually see it with my own eyes, because I could not, I could not understand in my mind how sanction, you know, safe outdoor space or sanction camping could work. I've always said that. I was super hesitant for the longest period of time. But going and seeing it myself, showing up unannounced, yeah, it, it yeah. was it was eye, eye opening for me. So, in you know, a round trip to Denver, it could be a hundred bucks. You know, for a couple hours, go fly in, go check it out, come back. Okay, I mean, easy, but easy. can we? I mean, I think I, don't know, I think we I think we've I just we understand where every council member is at on this issue, okay. <laughs> and it sounds like no one's an absolute no. So there's just a little bit more conversation that needs to happen before budget adoption. On these okay. on these things, aren't we essentially voting for? Pl- placeholders though until like like for the NOAA we're essentially voting for 1.2 million as a placeholder until can develop the that, terms though. but, but it's th- essentially until they come up with the terms and then come back to us and we say yes this is what we're envisioning or we need this here I, it's it's that's I, I what think, we're doing with all this I money right the answer is yes but what I'm hearing is there's two council members that are not yet even comfortable putting the placeholder okay. in and, and that I'm somewhere in the middle Jen, so. I, and I have a question for Jen. You moved stuff around, like you moved the NOAA to Thorman Hat funds that have more requirements. And I thought that, how did that change from it was higher in the flexible dollar? No, no, it, it, this is a different sheet. Oh, okay. Than the one we're than the one that's in your um, staff report. Easy this is just going through sources and uses, okay. yeah. and so the dormant fun, the dormant HUD funds, and I, and you know, there, it's more requirements than the general fund, but not more requirements than the really uh, strict HUD funds. Okay, all right. It, it's not higher or lower in priority. Oh, it's just okay. sources and uses. <clears throat> okay, but but the, but it, it's always been there in the. Dorman had funds that have requirements? No, this is just as of yesterday. So So what we're doing, we asked the administration if they could please help us with if you if you just were making the best decisions you can with the right sources, if you're matching up the sources and uses in the most efficient way that you can, not putting extra strings on anything that can't take strings, but putting the, putting this matching the strings with the needs, um, that's that's what they did, and they really. Um, worked a long time with Jennifer. They had already worked it through, and then they worked some more on it with Jennifer. So this is stuff like, the, the type of strings on that are things like needs to relate to housing. Okay. Or, you know, so the Whereas like general stuff. fund dollars don't need to be spent on housing. Yeah, so simple stuff. Yeah. So we're pretty confident. So this is the sheet you were looking okay. at before. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. just different yeah. ways to show the same information. Yeah. The tricky one is, is the, um, partnership with um, neighbor works that's the trickiest but other than that these are 
Right. And that neighbor works partnership is proposed for the most flexible dollars. Right. It's proposed for that those general fund dollars. General the reason I dollars. wanted to share yes. this version, um, sorry, is just to point out that the total does not you don't you're not spending all that money. We still have a So you still have four hundred and forty thousand. Your options with that are use them to balance the general fund because they are general fund dollars. They started as general fund dollars. Or you could increase the RDA's NOFA, because that's what they were originally proposed for. Next count, the yeah. next section already has it increased by quite a bit. Yes, yes. And, okay. and that's as a result of the um, CAN and RDA collaborating and realizing that that was a really efficient way Good to... Good way to use those dollars yeah. and the amount of dollars available for that use is actually yeah. six, it's six point six Yes, point yeah. So, um, or you could add money to any of those projects above. I mean, I feel pretty comfortable with all the, personally, all, all the things that we've talked about so far. So I, I would sort of think let's use it to balance the general fund, personally. But Okay, but what about the request that Council Member Pui had on the senior center? That's the last one that's here. That's the last talk, one. So yeah, let's talk about I, I guess one way to describe it is each box is a different pot of money. Okay. So the pot of money that's funding the, the Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing Loan Program and now the pot of money that's funding the RDA NOFA are these dormant HUD funds. And that's the transmittal that we just got today. So two items within the transmittal we got today are using those dollars. Okay. For the Sunday Anderson Senior Center, there are RDA housing funds that are, because it's a housing project and because the income can be restricted appropriate to the project and because it's in a project area, it qualifies for multiple okay. RDA housing fund dollars that are already in the budget. So okay, there is $1 million in the secondary housing fund that was originally proposed for housing property acquisition and then $1,013,000 in the primary housing fund that was originally proposed to be shared equity housing that the board could decide to allocate towards this project. What would that be taking away from? I realize property acquisition of yeah. properties we so, yet to be determined. And I don't know, let's see, Danny's here and he could jump up and clarify, but in our discussions, there wasn't a specific project in mind for that. It was just putting money there because those were both uh, priorities, priorities of the board. Uh, okay. Uh, let me. Uh, Mr. Go ahead, Councilmember yeah. Pui. Thank you. I um, I uh, I was uh, pleased to to hear that the administration uh, you know was supportive of this 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 plan uh, and and in general supportive of some of these uh, funding mechanisms to to get there. So uh, it is not only you know this random council member's idea, but it is more about. It seems like the stars are aligning to make this uh, project happen. So just wanted to add that there. I I, have, I think it's a good idea, ha having housing on that lot. It seems like there's enough place, space for housing. It does seem like there's that, like, it's an idea worth figuring out. It sort of feels to me like, I guess I've, I've, I've been hired and paid by enough clients that had really good ideas on lots that seemed like they were totally going to make sense, and then you found a situation where it was completely impossible to do something. So I'm wondering, is there a mechanism to say, Yes, look at this. We'll like earmark this for this project, but if you can't figure out a feasible project proposal in the next six months or year, then we re, re like reallocate. reroute it, reallocate it to yeah. the. Uh, I mean, it will have to. I think that would. I think that would naturally. Fund, it will it have would, to be like that. It would. Yeah. The, uh, my understanding is that because the county is using our, their ARPA dollars, it would need to be figured out by We're middle thinking, of next okay. year at the earliest or at the latest, and so. Um, RDA funds don't drop to fund balance, and the so the county already committed ARPA dollars for that site. Our understanding is they have, because okay. I guess the senior center is in need of reconstruction, and so they're using ARPA dollars to make that happen. So the context on this: the the county uh, allocated some money, I believe, it's six or seven million dollars to remodel the building inside. But ideally, it could be something else. And if they, in my opinion, if they put that money in remodeling the insides of the building, we're stuck with that building for another 20 years. So I'm developing this lot, you know, and all the things that. So this could be the opportunity. The incentive is there. Okay. So we put it in. In let's say we do it. We put it in there. The count. The county or whoever county owns the land, right? Yes. So the county can figure out 
what they're proposing to do? Do they come back to us at some point and say, here's what we're proposing? Or just like, we I put housing and it was for giant mansions like how do how do what guardrails do we put on to make sure that the kind of housing that supports the community i'm speculating but i think what would happen is the rda staff would work with county staff to figure out what is needed my guess just as basic guess is that two million probably would not be enough to I put housing not, yeah. and so that would be the natural step at which point they would say based on preliminary design or based on preliminary conversations about how the county and city will share funding strategy. And maybe the county would put in more um, based on, you know, further um, conversations. Right now, their their increment contribution to the nine line is quite limited <laughs> um, based on the original conversations. And so they could put more increment from that property on, into it. Anyway, I think uh, it's accurate maybe to say that the RDA staff would work on that and come back to the board because this amount it probably, probably isn't, isn't the final amount, right. or is it the final amount? But I was, what I, what I understand, like they already allocated seven million dollars. Like at least they're contemplating seven million dollars to do something with the property, but maybe not just to rebuild it, but uh, to fix it. But maybe it's like, well, let's do new construction, let's do housing, and maybe we can ask the city to contribute a little bit. And I, I guess think my that's question, wants to contribute. maybe let me ask a separate question. Secondary housing fund money and primary housing fund money, do those have deadlines? Those do not, right? No, but okay. they have requirements about and limitations about where AMI the money can be spent location. and what AMI okay. is served. Okay. Well, and that's that, why this project kind of fit well that's good. because it's in a project area and and, and, and but it's I an guess AMI. I'm saying like just the number of months that right. it takes to get a housing project going i'm the bigger challenge of, honestly the bigger challenge is the county's money not our money yes i have a i have a medium level of confidence that something could actually <laughs> happen before the county has to spend their money on those yeah. interior remodels but i'm okay putting some money in there saying trying to figure out something better and if you can't at least we still know we can use these dollars right that that makes me more comfortable with this right. and i just want to confirm this, this all this is not coming out of the general fund right okay housing fund this yes, is all this is this is money that's in the rda sorry it's in the rda budget right. so this is all all these funds are coming out of the third column on the housing fund column side right, right. On the, on their which is either yeah which is either the dormant hud funds or i should have put in the title rda housing yeah funds. it's it's all yeah. the housing funding not mm -hmm. the general fund yep. everything we've just talked about is coming out of everything besides the general fund yep because I, I i think there was some a little confusion think, back there on the um sanctioned camping and some other things about since they're flexible they're coming out of the general fund well okay so if you want to be really technical because I, I do want to <laughs> technically, be technically yes okay to be technical sorry to be technical you're right those are they originated as general fund dollars they were but they're funding our future dollars uh the, there's a combination of funding our future dollars and dollars that are in excess of what's needed to fund the North Temple Viaduct debt service. And the board had previously had the desire to keep that extra money in the area. That's why the partnership with NeighborWorks kind of works for that funding. But the other funding, the Funding Our Future money, which is 2.6-ish million, was originally general fund dollars that was sent to the RDA for the purpose of the NOFA. Right. Um, the proposal would be to keep it in RDA, just use different purpose, use it for a different purpose. Because right, I'm just trying to make sure that people understand that the general fund and our fund balance isn't being impacted. Right. Yes, fund balance is not part of this discussion. Right, so the fund balance isn't being impacted by these uh, funding uh, requ requests. That's accurate. Okay, I, I want to try throwing something out there. Can we pull up that same sheet that you just had? Yep. I would propose a straw poll that we support this sheet with the changes to being that switch point gap goes down gap finance goes down 250 it's updated up there yeah oh that's already been switched yep. that's, yeah, that we switch. hold on the sanction camping ground we can have a more a bigger discussion about that in a separate straw poll um that the but that the other the remaining of these we support from the proposed sources that Jennifer just said. And I would propose that those 440 or 940 if Actually, we don't do the... So it would actually be more. I haven't changed the 
funding for the West Side Community Initiative. So just hold. Oh, okay. Yep. Let's hold on. Or from the West while Side Community Initiative. While she's doing that, do we think in good faith we have time to actually discuss the sanction camping, or can we request uh, I, for a placeholder I'm, and then discuss it after budget? I just if there's if there's time, I'm fine with it. I just don't want to lose the possibility of a good idea. Well, acknowledging that additional clarification. Well, I, I want to. I guess my, my intention right now is to straw poll everything that I think we have consensus on, and then we can propose an addi additional straw poll for that one item. It was my intention, and that, that could be... I mean, I think that there is... Okay, okay, go ahead. I, I think we have consensus on everything but one, so I, I would like to straw poll all of those items first, if that's all right. We might not, but... Okay, <laughs> so that's... $2.1 million for Neighbor Works Partnership. Oh. It's $1.4 $1.4 million for Neighbor's Work Partnership from General Fund, Seven hundred from Westside Community Initiative, 100000 for ADU Incentives. Million. Million. One million, million, thank you, for ADU Incentives. 250 for Switch Point Gap Financing. Uh, one point two million for the Naturally Occurring Affordable Loan Program coming from the Dormant HUD Funds and 6.47 from the dormant HUD funds being used to fund the NOFA at a, at a rate higher than in the mayor's proposed budget. So that gives uh, 6.476014. Um, and then 2.013820 Sorry, can I insert just new information? Yes. Um, just a quick conversation with Danny just now that funding for this project it might make sense to pull it might make sense to pull from this project also from the west side community initiative maybe we could are we saying this project being sunday anderson mm -hmm, sorry the sunday anderson partnership could we maybe broaden it and say rda housing sources okay and then that way the straw poll could be whatever I like technical i think that's great okay like that. okay so the the sunday anderson as noted on the sheet would be would be sourced from RDA housing sources, whichever is the most appropriate. Um, and then the remaining, well, I propose that we don't, this straw poll does not touch the remaining 1.4. Right. Let's. Okay. Yeah. Does that make sense? That was, the, sorry, that did not go over smoothly. So straw poll for. <laughs> it makes sense to me. Everything, Everything is highlighted. 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 Yes, that's a really smart way to do it. <laughs> and you, yeah. Everything highlighted in yellow. <laughs> Does everyone, does everyone understand that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Who, uh, please indicate with your thumb if you Thumbs support myself. the things that are highlighted. Okay. So that is six to zero uh, supporting those items. Does anyone want to propose a separate straw poll for the remaining items? I, I want to ask a question to Jen before we propose anything else. So on... On the sanctioned camping, right, I didn't understand that we were moving 250 to that one to make it 500,000. But if that was the case, I think that's what uh, Councilmember Petro proposed. Oh, yes. Oh, you Petro okay. proposed. All right. But I think that that needs to be that still need, yeah needs to be troubled. But 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 let's say let's say it was 250. We left it as before, and then we have 1.4 million dollars left over, the flexible dollars remaining. Would that be a? Would, can we put that money? into the general fund or it stays in somewhat of a housing limbo fund because so it's dormant? I think it depends on how you view the, how strictly you view the previous intention for both the funding our future dollars and the North Temple Viaduct funding because from a purely technical standpoint, there's not a requirement that you spend funding our future dollars on RDA stuff, right? Like it's for general housing and so, okay. or any of the funding our future categories. So you could technically count that money as general fund dollars, but you have to spend it on a funding our future category thing. Or you could you, technically legally, you are allowed to spend funding our future dollars on anything. Um, it's just that you've made a commitment to the taxpayers that you'll track it. Um, the other thing that it depends on how quickly you view your prior policy direction was that $1.7 million from the North Temple Viaduct Debt Service. There's not a requirement that you spend it in the area or that you spend it on housing. It's just a payment from the RDA to the general fund to pay us back for debt service that we covered to rebuild the viaduct initially. So 
I guess, I guess, I guess it's yes. Yes. You can put it back in the general fund. You may want it to be directed towards funding our future categories. If you wanted to stay true to those original policy Are those 1.4 or 1. Point, uh, 1. 1.39. That's, that's moving or, the yeah. camping down to 250. Is that, um, that's from funding our future, which is ongoing. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. So this would help. Well, it's also from. It, you could. I mean, it's all mingled together. It's with also from North Temple. North Temple which Viaduct. Which is one time. Well, it has been ongoing for several years that there has been more increment there than is needed to fund the debt service. So I'm. I'm not confident that 1.7 will be available every year, but some amount of money will be available every okay. year. Can, just for my clarification, can we be put funding our future, just right at that 1.14. The flexible dollars remain just like a either, yeah, funding our future so we know it's not, yeah, that helps me. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> Legally, it's flexible. Policy wise, policy wise, it may not be. Right, right. <laughs> well, and there are quite a few items on, there's a few items on the list that I think, depending on your definition of public safety, um, might, might be eligible for uh -huh. funding our future. Like Certainly. some of the things, so, or or housing, or I, transportation. I, I guess council member, uh, do you want to talk more about sanction camping right now? Or I, I w that's what I was going to go to. I wonder if we should have an opportunity to chat uh, to try to answer some of these questions before we. It's, it seems like there is a general understanding of what maybe this is, but the details is where we are getting caught up a little bit, and I need to work on a little more of the details. Again, knowing that I'm hopefully asked the administration to come up with many of these details, but maybe we are going to create some boundaries. Um, so if that's okay with everybody, can we punt this uh, a specific question on sanction camping to the next next uh, unresolved uh, issues yeah. discussion. Yeah. Can I but ask this though, budget season? Can I wait? We're going to do it before we do budget, or you want to? I think the proposal okay. is to wait until yeah. the next time, like in, like in, in a, a week. week. In okay, a week. in a week. Okay, sorry. Not but in a can year. I ask the council people who have concerns what specifically are you asking for? Because this feels to me like we're at a similar level as what we're suggesting with the NOAA. And so if there's specific information that we can be refining or marinating on or, or working with you to get to a place, I'd like to do that. But it feels like we delegate details to staff all the time. I, I can answer that for myself. Yeah. I, I think um, the, the NOAA feels like totally in line with the things that we already do, which is support homeowners, get affordable housing units dedicated deed restrictions, and I, I don't see any land use or uh, public safety uh, layers to the discussion where with the sanctioned camping, I, I think sanctioned camping, it needs, I'm totally supportive of us having this conversation, having it being part of our broad puzzle of solutions, um, but I think there are those additional layers that I want just some time to think about, which are, wh what are the impacts? what public safety issues, what are the land use laws that need to be overcome in order for a person to even be allowed to do that? Um, is it something that lasts permanently or do we, do we need to, like for instance, do we need to put in a six month temporary land use ordinance to allow this to happen, which then naturally allows it to rotate to different places? I, I don't know exactly how that works. I think we can figure it out, but yeah. there are just more, more questions than there are with the NOAA. Uh, no, I could just add a tiny bit, if I may, and that is that um, yesterday we had a meeting with um, three of the council members, Council Member Pui, Petro, and Valdemoros, and the mayor, and um, I think it worked out really well. She is not opposed to having some sort of incentive, but was interested in uh, participating with the council members in a meeting with Wayne Niederhauser with the state so that we keep the state uh, role and the city role and the county role clarified and that um, we ask him for more information about what would help him get over the barriers that he's facing and that type of thing. So 
I think we're on the right path to get more information and we should have more by next week. Yeah, that meeting's tomorrow? Yes. At what time? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think I'll speak for myself, but I think all of us would probably ap appreciate a recap or, or information that is Well, new this helps us. This helps us. We can us. talk about that at the next public meeting or whenever. Well, this helps us go into the discussion gathering or solidifying points that would easier. Chris, and did you have something? I, I, can I just add on the, on the idea that the Denver model really looks good now. The Miami model also looks really good to us, and we have a lot of things, but they've been doing it for 20 years. Denver might also have been doing it for, so what is their lessons learned on how they got to where they are? Because they didn't just show up there and it was magically there. They probably had some iterations. So part of, the, part of the discussion that we have here is that let's learn from them so we can leap forward, but let's not think that we can just leap right to their position now because yeah, yeah. I know and I agree and I acknowledge that and I think obviously what we have right now going on with the unsanctioned campaign is not ideal uh, absolutely. and this is trying to minimize that Ab ab absolutely I agree with you and that's why the discussion with Wayne is so important yes okay Are we done? Scheduling oh let's go to scheduling before people start leaving oh we were supposed to do that already sorry effort that's okay. Um, so our meeting that we were having on the 8th is really not going to work based on council member schedules. And we're also worried that we won't have the numbers from the state in time. So we wanted to know if there's any chance that you could meet on Monday, June 12th, sometime in the afternoon, anytime after 1 p.m. Uh, the fallback would be June 9th, but we're that one's not as good in terms of getting, being sure we have accurate information from the state. Then while you're thinking about that, the other thing is that um, in order to fill the District 7 vacancy that will be here in uh, July, we need to add a meeting in July. Your um, meetings so far are the 11th and 18th. Uh, the Chair and Vice Chair were looking at adding a meeting on the 25th. Uh, hopefully what we could do is switch the uh, formal business to that meeting, but use the 18th of July to, um, to fill the vacancy. Thank you. And uh, Council Member Fowler, if we do it on this timing, Council Member Fowler would not be participating, and um, she recognizes that. She, she was not asking us to rush uh, in order for her to participate, she recognizes the difficulty in rushing. So, I'm, I advocated for an earlier appointment. Um, the 18th seemed earliest, but we're going to be making CIP dec decisions by August, and I really think it's important to have someone who knows the roads, knows the parks, knows their district during that discussion to make sure the rest of the money gets allocated with equity. So two asks, Monday, June 12th, anytime after 1, and Tuesday, July 25th, regular 2 p.m. to 9 p.m. Do those not work for anybody? Um, I'll be out of town on the 12th, but I'll try to participate remotely. Is the 9th better for you? Uh, it is. Um... But we only have a two-hour gap on the ninth that works for anybody, right? Yeah, I and we can't guarantee we'll have what we need. And we might not have the numbers. Okay. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll look at the times, um, but I I think I can participate remotely for at least part of the meeting. I would be out of town on the ninth, but could participate remotely. My preference would be the twelfth. I can do either. And I prefer the 12th, not the 9th. Okay, Council Member, will you just get, us, get back to us with your availability on the yes. 12th? Yep. Um, all right. All right, and then the 25th. Works for me. Okay. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, Council Member, do you want to end the meeting here? Or what? Yes. Well, I, I everyone's leaving. Timing. Okay. <laughs> well done. Um, we just, when's our next unresolved issues discussion? On Tuesday the 6th. Um, there's a couple, I think there are one or two more departments left. CIP, we'll have an initial discussion on CIP and then the next unresolved issues discussion. Okay, thank you. Thanks.